If she has another facelift, she's going to end up with a goatee. Adam Curry, John C. Devorak. It's Thursday, August 16th, 2018. This is your award-winning Gitmo Nation Media Assassination, episode 1060. This is No Agenda. On continuous poop patrol and broadcasting live from the capital of the drone star state here in downtown Austin Tejas in the Cludio in the morning, everybody. I'm Adam Curry. And from northern Silicon Valley where we turn the show into a post-Zephyr show. I'm John C. Dvorak. It's Craig Vaughn and Buzzkill in the morning. I believe we've had many a post-Zephyr episode. Yeah, but we went from a pre-Zephyr to a post because it, it ran down the tracks just as you as you got cut off. Okay. Well, mark it down in your book. Did you get the serial number and its registration and everything? You <laughs> foamer. Tail number. You foamer, you. The, tail number. The, the, the new uh, Zephyrs have big tails. Well, uh, the news cycle, of course, changed dramatically just overnight. Yeah. Aretha Franklin died. Oh, yeah. 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 She was on her last legs. Rip, it, rip everybody. Rip love and light. Now, everyone's posting selfies. Yeah, look, here's me with Aretha. Uh, I, I, I never worked with her, but I worked with a lot of people who worked on big shows with her and, uh, she was pretty universally hated as a diva and very, very bossy, uh, demanding, uh, apparently just not very nice. <laughs> and that's my eulogy. <laughs> Great. Bring him up on stage, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry. You know, that's no wonder you're not in the industry anymore. <laughs> that's all I can't heard. even fake it. That's all I've heard all my life about her. I was like, I'm not I'm not gonna fake it. I'm not. I'm not well, I heard the same it. thing about Donna Summers who we who when yeah. I was at Pewter Shop. See, I disagree. Donna Summer I did work with. What a sweetheart. Well, that's not the case when she got older, maybe. Well, one of our producers played uh, the bass on uh, I Feel Love. Oh, okay. Well, maybe he knows. And he says, I, th- uh, I think but, she was uh, sweet. Uh, Van Morrison's supposed to be hard to work with. Yeah, who wants to work with Van Morrison <laughs> anymore? <laughs> anyway, so, I, you know, that does make a difference in the in the news cycle. Everyone's, because, you know, the minute there was an announcement she was sick, everyone's putting together their retrospectives. Well, what, we'll what see was, a lot of respect puns. Oh, yeah. <laughs> R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Yes. Now, I uh, the, the funny thing about this particular one, first Mimi tells me about, oh, Aretha's going to die. Uh-huh. And then Jay tells me about it. And it's like, no, it, it, a lot of people die during the year that are old and famous. Yeah, but she spans four decades, four generations almost of uh, of. Of listening so audience, James Brown, but nobody told me he was going to die when he did because he died during plastic surgery, <laughs> <laughs> which is and not a good way to go. No, it's like you you expect waking up fresh and young looking with some bruising for a couple of days. Yeah, but not dead. No, so, yes. you don't wake up. You don't expect to wake up dead. You'd never want to wake up dead. Let's see. Um, I did a lot of. <sighs> You know, Turkey is becoming uh, a problem. We've been looking at Turkey for years, have always identified its uh, its growing issues. Uh, but what is so interesting to me is that the, the Ottoman Empire, I think, is taught in school as a timeline with a big cloud around it, you know? And here's the Ottoman Empire, and then after the Ottoman Empire, all this happened. But really what went on during the Ottoman Empire and, and that uh, Turkey or Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, was the the center of the universe. I don't think it's really taught in schools. I, I certainly didn't get uh, an, even more than a summary of what was going on. Do you know? Yeah, it would be part of world history courses taught in co- at the college level. college level. Yeah, and in the Netherlands, it would be mentioned in passing in high school level. Um, and it was a friend of mine said, "Oh, you should uh, watch The Promise." which I think came out last year, this movie. It's about the uh, Armenian genocide. It's a love story, a tri- love triangle type story, and it's a personalized story, but it gives you a pretty good impression of, of what was going on when the, uh, when the Turks massacred the, uh, the Armenians, which has never been uh, officially recognized by any Western leader, I don't think. I think Trump may have touched on it. Hmm. Well, he would be the he would be the first, according to the the Book of Knowledge, 
But holy crap, man, that that was some that was not. Okay. And we just kind of stood by and like, eh. it was not OK. <laughs> well, well, we stood oh, well. by. We weren't big world powers then. Right. In the 19, right. Early 1900s. Right. We didn't want to be drawn into world anything. World yeah. But, the, you know, the, there was a lot going on where we had naval fleets that could have done something. Probably not. Anyway, here's a, a report about uh, Turkey. It's uh, more in-depth than most, especially coming from Euronews. The financial turmoil continues for Turkey. Investors are heading for safe havens, and markets in the U.S. and some in Asia have been losing ground amid fears Turkey's crisis could spill over into the world economy. The Turkish lira has been in free fall. It's lost almost more what? ground on Monday against the U.S. dollar, and in the past year, it's fallen by more than 40%. Well, Turkey's central bank has acted to get more money into the banking system, but has resisted calls to increase the main interest rate, which currently stands at 17.75%. An increase could help attract investors who've taken fright over growing debt and deteriorating relations with the United States. Well, as of May, Turkey's private companies owe more than $240 billion, and it's this debt that's helped private consumption grow the economy at a pace that many now believe is unsustainable. Well, that means that foreign banks could face big losses if those companies can't repay their debts. Spain's BBVA is the most exposed, with Turkey accounting for 13% of its loans. Italy's Unicredit, the Netherlands' ING, and Woo-hoo! France's BNP Paribas are also well and truly on the hook. Now, is this in, in any manner analogous to Greece? I don't think so. No. Greece is, Greece is being squeezed by the Central Bank of the EU. Right. Uh, this, these yeah, guys of course. are just they being sanctioned the, by the United true, States. True, 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 true. Spiral. I, I guess maybe more that there's foreign banks that have interest in them and they're, oh, they're every, going yeah, to have, well, that's going to be the case with any of these countries. They always, everybody's intertwined. Could this the, trigger the, the uh, could this trigger the Armageddon? You know, I personally, somebody else asked me this, one of the Lib Joes. <laughs> And I said, I don't think they have the leverage as an economy to really trigger a... Yeah, it's uh, not big at all. It's not. No, we already looked at this on the last of societies a little bigger in Argentina. Right, but if the, if if they go... And that's never... And that's been in and out of business for years, and that's never triggered anything. Right. But I guess contagion would be what people are worried about. If it catches on to other countries and investors start pulling their money out, that could that could then maybe start to affect the euro? I don't think so. They're not in the euro. They're not in the uh, mm-hmm. eurozone. No, I say if, if it goes to other countries. I don't see it happening. Okay. Well, good. When, but we just, I'm looking for the trigger. You know, you've, you've predicted this uh, uh, well, certainly look, economic yeah, downturn. Too. I just don't see this being it. I mean, it'd be, it'd be convenient. The mm. timing would be good. But yeah. I just don't see it. It's just a weak, it's a weak sister. It doesn't have enough oomph hmm. to really cause an issue. Well, there's a lot being written about it now. More about China. Uh, you know, which China we- is really the. I think China is the one to keep an eye on because they those guys that we don't even know what's going on. They're really they faked their numbers. Yeah, you and, can't tell. It's a black box. It's a black. Yes, right. exactly. Right. Okay. I mean, that's. A, I had a report on this from CBS, and I now you ran that. But the CBS report sucks. <laughs> good report you were right where is it? where's your cbs report oh here it is brouhaha gets worse <laughs> this is an economic war according to turkey and the enemy is america it's nato ally the turkish lira has been falling in value for months but last week it plummeted 20 percent because of a dispute with washington over this man andrew brunson an evangelical pastor from north carolina who's lived in turkey for more than 20 years and is accused by the Turkish government of terrorism and spying. Pastor Brunson has been detained here in Turkey for nearly two years. The U.S. says it's seen no credible evidence against him. I have a message on behalf of the President of the United States of America. Release Pastor Andrew Brunson now or be prepared to face the consequences. Those consequences are U.S. sanctions and a doubling of tariffs on Turkish steel and aluminum announced by President Trump on Friday. In retaliation, Turkey's doubled tariffs on U.S. passenger cars, coal and other goods and announced a boycott of U.S. electronic goods. 
These angry Turks tore up fake dollar bills in protest. Many people here believe this crisis is all the fault of the US, even though experts have been warning of danger signs for months. Some blaming Turkey's authoritarian president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. There was a, a video going around about a couple of Turks smashing iPhones with a hammer. Did you see that? Yes, I did. And at the end, you hear an iPhone ringtone. <laughs> it's like, we're smashing these iPhones, except for the one I have in my pocket. Yeah. <laughs> very, very funny. I did get a note from one of our producers who's extremely in the know on Turkey. And I'm not going to mention his name because I don't know if he wants this attributed to him, but I'll share it. Uh, because, you know... We have a couple things in here. The the failed coup, this guy who's uh, the pastor, who may or may not Brunson. be... Sorry? Brunson. Yeah, who may or may not be a spy. But here's what our source says. Does the economic, the current economic chaos in Turkey seem like a soft coup, a la the methods outlined in the economic hitman? Short answer, yes. Can Erdogan keep the Turkish economy upright without IMF support now? Maybe not. Banks in Germany, France, and Spain will be pushing for IMF loans to back up the Turkish economy. They have large loans on their books to Turkey, which we just heard. I think said banks and others would welcome more stable leadership in the country. Enter the Gulen movement. There he is, our friend in Pennsylvania, in the Poconos. While roundly hated in Turkey, they have strong support in Germany and the USA may be seen as more easily controllable. This actually makes things come together for me. Earlier this year, I talked with someone involved in the Brunson matter, an American. I was told that Mike Pence and the Turks had reached a deal, but factions within the CIA and State Department were working to frustrate their agreement in order to make Erdogan look as bad as possible. I heard last month while in D.C. that Brunson would be released from prison after Trump himself had negotiated the release of Turkish Hamas courier tourists being held in Israel, which I think happened. Yes, the Turk was released, but Erdogan only released Brunson to house arrest in Turkey, not what was envisioned. About 10 days ago, Erdogan formally announced that Turkey would join the BRICS. I missed that news. Did you hear this? No, not at all. So it would be the Brixit. <laughs> Brixit. <laughs> Brixit. I would guess that these two things may have personally angered Trump enough to impose sanctions. Uh, let's see, what else does he say here? Erdogan and his government are very, still very pissed off that Gulen has not been extradited, extradited back to Turkey. They've repeatedly stated Brunson will have to go through the Turkish judicial process when the DOJ here blathers on about lack of evidence of how the extradition process is still under review, a tit-for-tat situation. It's likely that Brunson had some interaction with the Gulen movement. He lived in Izmir for 25 years, the city in which Gulen first gained a following. Given the Gulen movement's use of interfaith dialogue, which has been very successful in recruiting gullible sympathizers in religious circles around the world, I wouldn't be surprised if Brunson was caught up in some nefarious Gulenist BS. However, I've seen no evidence that he was a spy or working on behalf of Gulen during the coup attempt in 2016. Under the state emergency in Turkey, a lot of secret testimony, etc., has been gathered but is not released, providing an opaqueness to prosecutions of this type. Um... So it's it's see, just reading this. It seems to me that you know we know Gulen is was put in the Poconos by the CIA. They took care of his paperwork and everything. He's got his compound up there. He probably was used for the failed coup attempt, which I think is universally recognized now was a botched job somehow on our on the CIA's uh, part. I think, and maybe they they just I don't know. If, I'm not sure that that's universally recognized. Although it makes a lot of sense. It's recognized by Erdogan. Erdogan, a lot of people think, has <laughs> set the whole thing up to blame the well, CIA. That's, that was certainly something we looked at as well. Yeah, but within you know, everything I hear from you know people that we talk to, it's in in intelligence circles that reach us, which is the outer crust, crumbling crust of chalk. But okay, but we touch than, it. <laughs> at least that crumbling crust of chalk is better than most people get. Exactly. Exactly. So maybe they, you know, maybe they do want to try and you know another attempt, maybe a soft coup, get some Gulen people to take over. Uh, I I mentioned on the, the DH Unplugged show that I thought that there was an economic hitman model at work here. That's what it sounds like. That's uh, that's, so this, that's what our source just yeah, that's what our source just said. But meanwhile, this poor pastor stuck there. If, and if the guy's correct, which it doesn't wouldn't surprise me if the CIA is working against the administration because that's yes. all they that's doing. all they do. Yeah. Um, which is uh, too bad. Yeah, that's well, a mess. 
But yeah. I don't think it's not bringing the economies of the world down or anything else. It's just going to shake things up in Turkey. All righty. And talking about, you, not you mentioned this, we haven't heard any of this stuff, of course, by the mainstream media. I mean, they're more concerned about the, you know, the smashing of the iPhones. <laughs> um, yes. Is there's this, I got this other thing from Euro News, not you mentioned Euro News. And here's one. Listen to this. This happened on the day of the show. This is our show day uh, news. Yeah. Uh, Sunday. Uh, and tell me you know any of this. You've even heard of any of this stuff. This is the unreported oil and gas agreement from last Sunday. Funds that fall to the Caspian Sea say they've reached agreement in principle on how to divide up the oil and gas resources of the world's largest enclosed body of water. Russia, Iran, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan and oh. Azerbaijan say the bulk of the Caspian will be treated as a common resource that they will govern together. And the five say it will be given a special status, putting it outside the jurisdiction of existing international law governing lakes and seas. No agreement was found on the more contentious issue of where the seabed border should be traced, but Russian President Vladimir Putin nevertheless welcomed the principle of regional governance. It fixes principles of military political cooperation of the member states, he said, and guarantees the absence of the armed forces of non-regional states. The Caspian is believed to hold some 50 billion barrels of petrol and 300,000 billion cubic meters of natural gas. Hmm. Now, was Azerbaijan in, in that lineup? I didn't hear. I didn't. Yep, yep. Hmm. And so is Iran and wow. uh, Russia, Tur uh, Turkestan, Azerbaijan, and uh, uh, Kazakhstan. I think. That's an interesting little uh, little group there. No kidding. They got they got uh, say they got resources. They got the raw materials. They got the processors, and they got the sales uh, force in Azerbaijan. They got the whole thing. And then you just the pipeline through Georgia. Bada bing, bada boom. Very nice. No, I hadn't heard. I had that. no idea the Caspian Sea was that low. <laughs> I didn't with know the that either. Troops. Yeah. Uh, no, of course, none of this gets reported. No, you know, we just want more windmills in the United States. <laughs> just don't pay any, don't pay any attention to that going on over there. <laughs> As they cornered the market on natural gas. Jeez, the thing is just that thing is loaded with natural gas. Yeah. <laughs> God, it's ridiculous that this is ignored. That is that you know. Well, again, you know, as, I, as we started off today, it's like the whole, the whole news cycle is going to be R E S P E C T. Well, there's that, and then also, you know, like get, get, go vote, vote. Oh yeah, vote Democrat. Yeah. So the latest bomb, the latest uh, smart missile, in air quotes, is Amoroso. Yeah. Uh, and this is very easy to understand. And uh, do you have any clips? I have a, one or two, I think. I have one clip that we should play right away because it's Lawrence O'Donnell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and by the way, get the unhinged clip ready. <laughs> or no, that I stopped the hammering. <laughs> get it ready. Yeah. So here is Lawrence O'Donnell on Amarosa. Today, the people who follows me on Twitter, Patricia McClary tweeted, if you talk about Amarosa tonight, when there are 700 children still separated from their parents, then I will turn you off. But Omarosa is one of the reasons that those children were separated from their parents and are still separated from their parents tonight. Those children were separated because of the cruelty of the people working in the Trump White House, especially the president who thought it was a good idea to separate them. Omarosa and everyone else working for the Trump presidential campaign knew they were supporting a candidate who believed that the one thing that we didn't have enough of on the southern border was cruelty. That cruelty was going to be one of the methods that Donald Trump would use at the southern border to discourage immigration. Omarosa knew that. All of the Trump campaign workers knew that. And now Omarosa proceeds with her TV interview version of her Nuremberg trial. As she does that, she wants wants to use the defense the world heard frequently during the Nuremberg trials of Nazis after World War II. I didn't know. Stop the hammering! <laughs> I would agree, actually. 
Uh, That's pretty funny. So she, the guy's insane. Yeah, it's great. That's great. And and she's treated so seriously and taken, you know, such with so much respect. I saw her, I tried to get a clip from the the Daily Show Trevor Noah and she was on. And she was flirting with him and she was like a queen diva, but nothing interesting, nothing of of any use uh, at all. Now, I do have a clip from NPR where NPR uh has a gotcha. They got a gotcha on uh, Omarosa as they asked her to read, to start off in this interview, by reading a passage from her book. And I'm pretty sure she already recorded the audio book, as you will be, be able to uh, uh, discern from her, uh, from her read. On this phone conversation, I was told exactly what Donald Trump said. Yes, the N-word and others in a classic Trump goes nuclear rant. This seems pretty clear. She didn't hear the tape, but was told what was on it. But that's not what she said in her interview with Morning Edition. And once I heard it, you heard you have heard this tape. I heard this tape. You heard the president of the United States. The president of the United States use not only the N word, but as Bill Pruitt described during that interview, other horrible things during the production. Of the apprentice. You don't mention that in the book, that you've actually heard the tape. Is this new? Oh, no, it's mentioned in the book. But what Manigault Newman points to is that section she just read about the phone call. In the interview, Rachel Martin presses her to clear up the discrepancy. Forgive me, though, that sounds like you just heard his account of the tape. Did you actually hear the tape? I did. Did you miss this whole book? Girl, did you read my book? (laughs) Girl, did you read my book? No, girl, because you didn't even write your book. That's why. Girl, did you read my book? She did read the book. So did I. It's not there. In the book, Manigault Newman makes many claims about President Trump and others in the White House that would be shocking if true. That he has dementia. That he referred to people of color as those people. That he wanted to be sworn in on a copy of his book, The Art of the Deal, rather than the Bible. There's a lot. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders put out a statement that says in part, quote, this book is riddled with lies and false accusations. It's sad that a disgruntled former White House employee is trying to profit off these false attacks. And even worse, that the media would now give her a platform after not taking her seriously when she had only positive things to say about the president during her time in the administration, unquote. Those days are clearly over. Donald J. Trump is not only a racist, but a misogynist and a bigot. But the things that I heard come out of this man's mouth on the tape that I describe in this book, it completely shattered my belief in him being a decent person. But a big question now hangs over it all. Did she actually hear the tape as she claims now? Or did she simply hear a description of it as she says in her book, Unhinged? Mm-hmm. Thank you, Omarosa, by the way, for the fantastic ISO. I think this is a contender for the end of show. Girl, did you read my book? I think it's a contender. <laughs> that is a good one. It's a contender. Um, yeah, I have two. This I have two is, so work. this is very easy through the no agenda lens. It's not that hard to figure this out because I'm not kidding. She didn't write this book. She sat down with uh, someone from Schuster and Simon. and <laughs> or, or the other way around. Now, it, Well, hold on. Schuster and Simon, owned by CBS, who hates Trump, Trump yeah. Moonves, Redstone, it. it's a bunch of haters. And she came out, they've had this book, they wrote it up, and she probably told the story one way, and they decided not to write it that way because it wasn't, it sounded too vague, or they didn't, you know, just tried to not get sued into oblivion. Yeah, you don't want to get sued. And so, they, you know, it's just, it's it's horseshit. This is total... <laughs> yeah, this is... What this yeah, is... It's is, as bad as that it's other poli- book It's just out. political stuff, you know, and everyone's taking it seriously and doesn't see it for what it is, particularly the Simon & Schuster tie-in. Hello? Jeez. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Well, I, 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 I've told... I, don't know, I think I've talked about this on the show before. When you get ghostwriters, there's a bunch of different ways you can go. Uh, generally speaking, you, the ghostwriter gets his name or her name on the book cover. I haven't seen this book cover, so I don't know if there's another name on it. Is there? Do we know? Anyone know? Uh, I haven't seen cover? it, and I have not read it. So, Girl, I did uh, not read your book! 
And uh, so that's one way of doing it. You say uh, so-and-so, you know, the author with or the author and. Uh, yes. And then there's a third way of doing it where it's pretty apparent that the author didn't do anything. By the way, you then should have called the, me out. It's Simon and Schuster, not Schuster and Simon. You should have called I me did. out. I did. I said that. Oh, I I'm sorry. the other way around. Oh, now I understand what you're saying. Okay. Now I get it. Sorry. Anyway. So the uh, so there's a, these different models, and then there's the 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 what the real whopper of a model, which is maybe what they did, which is you you have a ghostwriter write the whole damn book. You got nothing to do with it except you tell a few tales, and then they embellish them. Uh, you, just done from an interview. You interview the person, and the ghostwriter is a ghostwriter. Literally, there's no mention of the person. Sometimes there's a thank you or something in the in the forward. And that's kind of the person who wrote the book. But that that in that case, it's almost like you get you have to sign a non-disclosure. Mm-hmm. Uh, you never get to talk, say that you wrote the book. Or right. you, you have right. nothing to do with it. And uh, you get paid more. You get paid like a lot more. You make most of the money. So I I've, don't know uh, what they did. But you're, you're right. She's, there's no way she wrote this book. I've written the outline for my book. Oh, yeah? You want me to write it? <laughs> no. What? I want the big dough. Well, there's other people vying for this spot. Oh, okay. Well, just give it to them. I really don't have the time. I'm still working on 10 other books. I want it to come out in my lifetime. (laughs) (laughs) I don't want it to be, you know, after the fact. I don't want to be posthumous publication. Uh, (laughs) Point well taken. (laughs) Yeah, it's a novel, by the way. Oh, good. It's novel. Yeah, so, any of the books that we ever publish will be novels. Yes, it's a novel. So, so far as they'll be novel. Yeah, or they'll be very novel. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's uh, so I, I just took all of my life stories and, and baked it into a spy novel, and it works frighteningly well. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, you could, yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. I'm calling it unglued. I, I'd call it unhinged, but it's too late. <laughs> yeah. Shoot. I miss it again. Uh, well, today, front page, or not front page, I don't know if it was the front page, actually, but in over 100 newspapers. No, it was more than that, I think. Uh, let me see what the New York Times said here. Uh, they all banded together uh, at the behest, at the uh, suggestion of the Boston Globe as they called for nationwide media response to Trump's attacks on the press. Because this has never happened before in the history of American politics. No president has ever attacked the press. Do you remember? First, the guy is a a trailblazer. Well, I I remember when over 100 newspapers agreed to run editorials on the same day defending a free press against Obama when he spied on the Associated Press, hacked Cheryl Atkinson, got phone records of reporters, tried to jail the guy. Yeah. Didn't the newspapers do it then, too? I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. But what's interesting, they took a very, because everyone could write their own op-ed. Or their oh, own, great. Their own editorial. Nothing like reporters writing op-eds. Well, I, I, well, this is from the editorial board. Okay, well, that's different. I'm sorry. Yeah, I should have said that properly. I'll just read the, the first two paragraphs because I thought they're, 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 they approach it from an interesting angle. And you may know more about this. In 1787, the year the Constitution was adopted, Thomas Jefferson famously wrote to a friend, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. That's how he felt before he came president anyway. Twenty years later, after enduring the oversight of the press from inside the White House, he was less sure of its value. Nothing can now be believed which is seen in a newspaper, he wrote. Truth itself becomes suspicious by being put into that polluted vehicle. Uh, Jefferson's discomfort was and remains understandable. Reporting the news in an open society is an enterprise laced with conflict. His discomfort also illustrates the need for the right he helped enshrine. As the founders believed from their own experience, a well-informed public is best equipped to root out corruption and over the long haul promote liberty and justice. And then comes this interesting bit. Public discussion is a political duty, the Supreme Court said in 1964. That discussion must be uninhibited, robust, and wide open, and may well include vehement, caustic, and sometimes unpleasantly sharp attacks on government and public officials. 
That kind of describes a Supreme Court decision against the purge from social media. Yeah, well, at least sure that's the does. way the way I took it. So like, why doesn't anyone pick that up? Because nobody wants to pick it. Here's the thing: I wrote a column this week, and I don't know if it came out yet. I saw it. Yes, I, I liked it, and it makes sense. It was very no agenda. Go ahead. The the publishers, the, yeah. the, these yeah, Facebook's it's section, a publisher. Section two thirty, basically. What set me off on it was a article. I forgot where it ran in some somewhere by Jeff Jarvis defending Twitter and Facebook as, you know, not publishers, but Jeff Jarvis? platforms. Oh, yes. Oh, that was Jeff Jarvis who did that? Yeah. Ugh, jerk. And so I read this thing. I said, this is a load. And so I decided I'm going to go to the other extreme. <laughs> and then I started thinking about it. Sorry. A load. <laughs> it was. Good and one. so I decided to go to the other extreme. And as, as I started thinking about it, Everything that we're calling a platform based on a dictionary definition and what I know to be a platform is bullcrap. The Internet is not a platform. The Internet is a network. You know, they had to remember when Sun Microsystems used to say the (laughs) network is the computer. The network is not the computer. It does no computing. It is not the computer. There's no way it's the computer. But we had. (laughs) But Silicon Valley has always dreamed up this crazy stuff so they can kind of market stuff. And these douchebags that run Facebook and Twitter and every all these other platforms that aren't platforms, they're publishing houses. They refuse to take legal responsibility for the evil deeds that they do. And they get they hide behind a cloak of this bull crap. Oh, no, no, no. We just let people push stuff. It's not our. We got nothing to do with it. We have nothing to do with it. Well, I think the, the best argument in your piece was advertising that a platform does not need advertising and that's one of the uh turing tests if you will to see if something is a platform so your your computer does not need advertising and it's a platform but facebag now to some developers it may be a platform but it's it's not it's just not the same thing then certainly not when it comes to well, speech. See, again, it's the definition. Even to some developers, it's not a platform. It's a mechanism that they can use to put their code in play. But it's, as a pla- it's not a platform per se. They have no control over it. If you have a platform, you own a platform. I, my PC, I own it. I can throw it out the window. I'm not, I'm I'm the, not the, arguing I'm with the, you, by the, the way. I'm a slave to Facebook's API. Mm. Um, no, nope. I mean it's just a, as far as I'm concerned, it's just the definition, and it's done for legal purposes, so they can flirt, so, yes. they can skirt the law. Yes, so they can't be sued because well, that was what made the internet grow and gave these websites license to grow, which I'm not yes, saying is bad. I agree with that. Uh, and w- Wikipedia as well, by the way, they they also are under the same. They use the same uh, section two thirty uh, yeah. le- legal argument. Uh, but your but your point crap. is let's right. Stop, let's, they are anyway. they are they are publishers because they're editing the output, and that's Even not if just by not deleting. Editing the output, they're publishers. They should be editing the output. They're just not editing it well. Mm, yes. And and the point I make in that column is, if you libel somebody on Facebook, it's no different than if you libel somebody in the New York Times. Right. The New York Times can be sued. Why can't Facebook? Because Mark's cool, man. Don't do that. Yeah, that's pretty much where it boils down to. So about this, uh, you know, the editing they do, the the AI, artificial intelligence that they that they de- deploy to be able to find all these uh, offensive hate speech posts. <clears throat> Here is a note from one of our producers who is an Uber driver. Now I'd never considered this. But, you know, because you know how I like to talk to the Uber driver and sometimes I would record them because they have interesting things to say because they're always from a different country. At least in Austin, Mm -hmm. they are. But it works the other way around, too. Our spy network, many of them drive in Ubers to pick up a few bucks here and there. And sometimes you hear something. In the morning, Adam, says Brian, quick sidebar to your recent discussion on Facebag and Texas. The other day I gave a ride, Uber to a paralegal that was traveling to Texas. She worked at Facebook campus of Playa Vista, L.A. Facebook and Google have slowly been taking over the area. Google took over the old Howard Hughes hangar and converted it to their space. Didn't know that. During the ride, she mentioned her travels, face bag, and her task while in Texas. Of course, I inquired for show intel. This is what I'm talking about. 
Your analysis of Facebook in Texas is accurate. Her task was to go to San Antonio and train the Facebook employees on how to grade all videos that are posted on Facebook and Instagram. She says someone actually watches all those videos. Yes, AI at its finest. She also <laughs> mentioned Facebook is creating guidelines for Hollywood production houses. Their next play will be YouTube and Netflix. So there's guidelines that they're creating that they're going to hand to Hollywood. This is interesting. Facebook? Mm-hmm. It makes sense. That's a diversification of their business. That makes a lot of sense to me. Huh. If, if they can become the de facto filters of hate, whoa, they have more data than anybody else. They can at least claim they know what they're doing. Well, while you're on the topic, Dan... University of California thinks it can be the arbiter of hate. And uh, I have a clip of what, a clip this, where they're describing one of their programs. Is this the clip that I played just on the last show? Is it? Yeah, probably. ADL and the... Yes. Okay, I'm where, sorry. Were you there last show? I don't remember this <laughs> clip. <laughs> we talked and you were like, why the creepy music? I even remember what you said about it. I did say those creepy news, but I don't remember it being the same. Huh? Okay. Well, I'm sorry. Well, no, it's okay. We're going to play it again. ADL and the University of California at Berkeley's D Lab have been working to develop a new approach to tackle online hate using the latest methods. The goal of the Online Hate Index is to help tech platforms better understand the growing amount of hate on social media and to use that information to address the problem. By combining artificial intelligence and machine learning with social science, the Online Hate Index will ultimately uncover and identify trends and patterns in hate speech across different platforms. We've just completed our first phase of research, and we found that the machine learning model identified hate speech accurately between 78 and 85 percent of the time. In the next phase of our project, we will look at specific targeted populations in a more detailed manner. We'll examine content on multiple social media sites, and we'll identify strategies to deploy the model more broadly. While there's still a long way to go with artificial intelligence and machine learning based solutions, we believe the online hate index will help tech companies better understand the extent of hateful content on their platforms by creating community based definitions of hate speech. That clip, that clip actually filled me with hate. You know, the thing, I must have been distracted by the music so much. Well, B- that, B12 comes to mind. I actually just took some. Okay, good. Um, the uh, well, there's a music. race. You see, there's a race on, John, and this is a huge opportunity. Ah, this is an arm, a hate arms race. Yes, this is a race well, to be, but there's a race to be the de facto go to place. We have the independent network of fact checkers, which includes Tucker Carlson's outfit, the Daily Caller Foundation, right? Yeah, you know, which like, the whole thing. I can't believe he's doing that. Douchebags. Yeah, total douche. Trying to be, you know, the arbiters of truth. I really despise that. Very disappointing. Uh, that includes Snopes. They're in there as well. So you got those guys over there. Snopes is also promoting itself now as a news source. Did you notice this? No, I really we don't visit. Them on I really don't visit Snopes much. They decided much. they're going to become a newspaper. Yeah. So um, let me see if I can do this. I've got a couple clips here. So Alex Jones got a timeout. A timeout from Twitter. You need a timeout. Go sit in the corner. <sighs> but they were hounding, I think, Dorsey so yes. much that they. Well, that- what I want to do is I have Dorsey responding to it first. Then I want to play the universally accepted language as to why he was kicked off. And then we, I actually have the, the real verbiage and clip form of what he actually said, which makes things even more interesting. Uh, because this is all about the rules and the terms of service and the community guidelines. Here's Jack Dorsey. Alex Jones on Twitter posted this week uh, what essentially is a video calling for people to get their battle rifles ready against the media. Okay, remember this, eh? Essentially said, get your battle arms against, get, get your battle arms ready against the media. You heard that? I heard that, yes. Okay, well, we'll just keep that in mind. Alex Jones on Twitter posted this week uh, what essentially is a video calling for people to get their battle rifles ready against the media, saying it's time to act, it's got to be done now, move criminally against people. 
sent a chill up my spine. How about yours? It did. I mean, there's a there's a number of actions. That- did, did it send a chill up your spine, uh, John? I never heard it. But, um, I just heard it from him. Well, well, he, when you hear it, chills will go up and down your spine. I oh, believe help uh, a call to incitement to violence, and uh, those are the things that we need to call to incitement to violence. Okay, so far so good. Battle arms against the media, calls of incitement to violence. Make sure that we're taking action on. You have you've taken action against him in, in this instance. What we is have. it? Can you tell us what it is? We uh, I believe we put him in a, uh, a timeout. Time um, out. Uh, removing his ability to tweet uh, for uh, for a time period. A timeout seems uh, juvenile. Seems minor compared to the implications of someone suggesting a call to arms against a particular call group. Call to arms in this case, against a group. The media. The media. How do you respond to that? Well, I feel you know any any suspension, whether it be a permanent one or a temporary one, makes someone think about their actions and their behaviors and. You think um, Alex Jones is going to change there. his behavior based on a time? Who is this douchebag um, interviewing we, we you? We have found... Uh, might be Lester Holt, actually. It sounds a little like him. Yeah. And ...that it does have the potential to change impact and change behavior. So um, whether it works within this case to um, change some of those behaviors and change some of those actions, I don't know. But this is consistent with how we enforce Okay, thank you, Jack. So Jack did not uh, argue with, uh, I guess it is Lester Holt, with his uh, assertions there that Jones called for uh, battle axe, battle rifles, I believe he said, uh, against the media, incitement of violence against the media. Uh, let's listen to the actual video, which I, I chopped out some silences, so it's a little bit shorter. Uh, and I guess when you're policing words over hate speech, I think we should really listen to the words and let's see if we can discern any actual hate. Well, didn't even mention hate speech, incitement to violence and battle arms against a group of people. In this case, the media. It now stands with you and the U.S. military, who I know already understand who the Chicom operatives and the traitors are to understand who's trying to take the First Amendment. OK, this is where I usually tune out, but we're going to keep keep with it, guys. <laughs> Stay with it now. Come on. You hey, can the Chicom. The Chicom. You can do it. You can do it. Who's trying to bankrupt the country? Who's trying to shut down everything? Who wanted, admitted they wanted to bankrupt health care in America to bring us to our knees? We're under attack, and you know that. You've pointed out mainstream media is the enemy. But now it's time to act on the enemy before they do a false flag. I know the Justice Department's crippled a bunch of followers and cowards. Okay, so I, we got to maybe dissect this bit by bit. So he's saying, you know who the enemy is. The enemy is... Did he say fake news or the media? No, no, he said the media. He said the media. And we have to be careful because they're going to come out with the false flag, the media. And I think what he's implying is that someone in the media will get hurt uh, and it will be traceable back to someone like Jones saying, go hurt the media. So, so far, he has not told anyone to do anything. But there's there's groups, there's grand juries, there's you call for it. It's time politically and economically and 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 judiciously and legally and criminally to move against these people. It's got to be done now. Any any call to violence there yet? Hello? Not to, by my definition. No, not mine either. Not yet. Get together the people you know aren't traitors and aren't cowards and aren't hedging their freaking backs like all these other assholes do. Woo! And let's go. Let's do it. Because they're coming. Now, in your wisdom, you may be playing possum and waiting for them to come in. But America needs to know that they've got their little pathetic commie red teams ready. And they've got their targets picked out. The sheriffs, the judges, the police chiefs, the patriots, the veterans, the talk show host, everybody. And everybody's going to be amazed when they come, when those cowards come. And it's going to hit in the middle of the night. And they're coming. Yeah. And they're coming. Say it again. And they're coming. Yeah. They think they can really take down America. So people need to have their battle rifles and everything ready at their bedsides. And you got to be ready. Okay. Is that incitement to violence yet? To have your battle rifles ready by your bedside with your, with your, with your nightcap on, I guess, and your gown? <laughs> is, that incite, is that incitement to violence? No, it's an incitement to public defense, I guess. Yes. Because it's not even incitement because it's just telling you to, you know. All right. right, let's. We got 14 seconds left. Maybe it's here. The media is so disciplined in their deception. Antifa attacked all these people at the White House, beat up reporters, beat up women, children. No coverage. 
mean, they've got discipline, folks. They've got criminal discipline because they're a bunch of followers. That's it. That's why he was uh, given a timeout for that video, for those words. Well, Lester Holt is the liar. Yes, complete liar. And Jack just sit there and went, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. So that's just not true. I no, mean, it's but, a lie. It's but, just a blatant NBC lie. But it will go down in history that Alex Jones called for people to come to arms against the media. It will yeah, go down in history that way. With, with weapons. Yes, that's how it's going to go down. That is your truth. Yeah. From now, from this day forevermore. Yeah, because they'll just harp on it. Yep. Yeah, I know. We, we've done this a million times on this show. Where yeah, we just show but the it, it, it's reality versus what they decide to make a meme. A lie. It's a lie. It's not a meme. No, it's a lie. It's a but lie. It's a, they turn into a meme. The lie is a, turns into a meme. So, and then we're like, oh, that Jones is terrible. You know what he did? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's good. Good catch. Uh, I'll, give you a clip, I'll give you a clip of the day for the deconstruction. Thank you. Clip of the day. Here's uh, NPR's Here and Now. Uh, a little bit more about the topic. Boy, Kurt Wagner, senior editor of social media for Recode. People have just been ferocious in their criticism of Dorsey. Well, Jack and Twitter have been really the last platform that still allows Alex Jones to operate. And so Twitter has a long history of really defending this idea of free speech. And, uh, you know, when Jack Dorsey came out last week and said, Alex Jones has not violated our rules, but all of the other companies found that he did, it uh, kind of opened himself and Twitter up for criticism. So, yeah, he has definitely taken a lot of heat over the last week. Well, how much is this complicated by the fact that Twitter is the main message service of our current sitting president. I mean, this is speculation, but how much are people speculating that Dorsey and Twitter might be uncomfortable about banning someone for violating a rule like, let's say, threatening violence when you have the president of the United States who's used Twitter to threaten violence against whole countries? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Hey, man. I think, you know, comparing to what we just heard from Alex Jones... You know, get your get your battle rifle, your musket, put it next to your bedside with your with your nightcap on versus Trump saying, I got a big red button and it worked, jabroni. Yeah, I think there's a she made a point there. You have the president of the United States who's used Twitter to threaten violence against whole countries. Well, I think it's very clear that Twitter is afraid of alienating this, you know, very, very conservative group. That's that's what it's called. Really, in some regards, it's it's a group I think that's probably crossed the line. At the same time, it has said in the past that President Trump gets, you know, basically special treatment on the platform and that because he is the president and everything he says and does is newsworthy, uh, you know, they're going to kind of hold him to a different standard than everybody else. And what I think that does, unfortunately, is it creates this um, approval for stuff that maybe would have otherwise been violated. You know, even if, uh, you know, it makes sense that the president shouldn't be kicked off Twitter because he's the president, um, he kind of provides air cover, if you will, for other people who probably are skirting those rules a little bit. Okay. Well, that's your NPR analysis. Um, let's look at the, uh, at the pressure tactics that were going on, you know, for... Um, well, sorry? Well, I'm just going to say... Before we leave that topic, oh, I'm not leaving the topic. Like I'm, I, I, I'm no, continuing. No, I mean on. before we leave the, his assertion standing okay. there like that. Yes, uh, that the president gets special treatment. What about Rob Reiner? Yeah, I well, mean this guy. He also gets special treatment. He gets obviously special treatment because I know myself and everybody else is complaining about him constantly. He in one of his tweets just recently, he's got oh. Uh, the would-be autocrat strikes again. John Brenner's a patriot, stripping the former CIA director, which shouldn't have a security clearance for sure, should f- frighten all patriots. When did these left-wingers or be all into patriotism and the flag? This has always irked me. In another one, don't you think? I mean, it just yeah, doesn't make any sense. Well, John, hello. Welcome to 2018. And, and the other one, he's got one. He says he calls he calls President Trump garbage. Garbage. And this is defended as criticism. Calling somebody garbage, especially the president of the United States, I think is rude. But calling somebody garbage is not criticism. No. No. What do they What do they say when the president does it? 
Oh, yeah, they jump all over him. Yeah, but they have a word for it, I'm sure. Yeah, well, anyway. Yeah, it's not, got... they, don't, they don't say he criticized, that's for sure. Slammed! That's pretty much. All right, pressure tactics. Why did Jack do this? Because clearly there was no violation if he actually listened or read a transcript. I think even the transcript, you couldn't get confused about there being an incitement to violence against a particular group, This in this case, the media, Lester Holt. No. Uh, a couple of ways. The first one, this is the one that I find interesting is there's a, a version of a Media Matters group out there, and they use something called Block Together. And Block Together... Uh, I funny this this is a coincidence. I didn't bring it up on the show, but I ran into the block together woman, Shannon Coulter. I, yeah. Oh, tell. Ex- and I no, well, I didn't run into her personally. I ran into her on Twitter. You want to explain and what it is first, or do we, or do you need to? She's got this program. I haven't. I just it's an app. Looked into it's an app. She's got this. What? It's an app. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm gonna. It's an app. Yeah. Program app. What is an app? What is app short for? Application. Yeah, but it's it, what is it's, a, it's a phone app. application it's a, software. It's a what phone is app. It's, it's a, f- a program. Yes, a phone program. And so what you do is you plug it in and you push the button. They've got a block list of about, I think it's 450. Every advertiser you can imagine. Yeah. And you push this button and now you've blocked them. Well, what they do is they select a number of them who are advertising currently on Twitter or whoever they're attacking They'll, and then everyone blocks that advertiser en masse, which I think does show up in their um, uh, statistics. I think they will see a, a loss of, well, engagement certainly, but views or whatever the, the measure is. So they probably notice it, and they, and they certainly hear about it. I don't know how effective it is, but I think this thing works. I think these type this proves you cannot monetize the network, by the way, because no matter how big you are, People are bigger. And so I, I have to say, although I disagree with it, I think it's a pretty cool idea. I thought it was a really cool idea. I don't like it either. And I don't like what they're trying to do. And there's just a bunch of lefties that are just, you know, right, meddlesome. But, yeah, but this, <laughs> this kind of stuff, it can't be stopped. This, this, is, this is what I mean by you can't monetize the network. You can't win. But you win. can do the same thing on the other side. This yep. app uh, is not a, what you would call, you know, something. It's not going to land a rocket on the moon it's just this little piece of code that anybody could rewrite to put other lists together yes. oh I yeah think it's a great idea it should yeah. be like a whole bunch of these yeah. we could have the no agenda block list no. <sighs> very short we love everybody well there's we're, a lot of people we're not block blockers <laughs> i am i block <laughs> people constantly now there was a claim made which i believe to be true by Marco. Marco is the guy who does the Overcast app, which is heralded as the best podcast app. I think he has some of the best features. I like that he's an independent developer. I like a lot about him, a lot about his product. It's a for-pay product. It's very inexpensive, and it's extremely good. Um, he actually came up with a new idea to to put a little um, uh, a new tag into the RSS definition. Now, as an, as a what do you call it as a namespace for donations so that now any podcast feed will be recognized by overcast and it's catching on so i think other podcast apps will do it uh, that there's a little dollar sign button or if you're in europe a euro button and you click on that it'll take you right to that show's donation page regardless of what it is whether it's like us with a dvorak.org slash na or a patreon page i think that's good i like that he's doing that stuff what i don't like is that he was using the Apple podcast directory. So as we discussed in the previous show, when Apple removes something, it, get, it gets removed all the way down the line because these uh, developers of, app, of um, I'm sorry, phone podcast programs don't have the, you know, the ambition, I guess, to create a directory themselves. And I have ideas on that, which we can talk about a separate time. But, Turns out Marco had actually overridden the Apple API and banned Alex Jones before Apple did it. And in this uh, snippet from his from his own podcast, you'll hear that he starts off by saying, well, you know, there was some person who was upset. But listen to the pressure that was put on this one single independent guy. 
What happened last week is the Alex Jones show. Um, there, I basically what happened is it crossed a whole bunch of lines of like things that you know it. Things like hate speech. and, and uh, By the way, he's an incredible lefty and didn't even hear the video, obviously. He didn't hear what uh, what the line crossing was. But that's okay. That's his religion. And, and you know, inciting violence and th- you know, things of that nature that like that are against Apple's terms for what they allow in their podcast directory and are in, in many jurisdictions are actually illegal. Um, and so a listener uh, emailed me saying, hey, I'm leaving your app because you host this content. A listener. And, and, and you know, it's horrible. I looked and I'm like, you know, this this should not be allowed. Like, this is clearly yeah. in violation. Of, clearly, it's not. You're full of shit. Of Apple's own content guidelines. I do have a mechanism uh, in Overcast that I can override a feed that would otherwise show up. And I can say this feed should not show up. I haven't used this mechanism very often. Um, I used it once before for uh, NRA TV. Oh. For similar reasons that I believe that it was violating Apple's own guidelines, I used this flag on these Infowars properties because it was very clear that they were violating Apple's guidelines, but Apple was not removing it from their directory. And I was hearing about it from a lot of people. Oh, now it's a lot of people. It went from one email to a lot of people. Gee, I wonder. You know, a few days a few days after I did that, Apple pulled them from the directory and so did everyone else basically and and so you know i, I think I, I was proven right um I, it was you know had i known apple was going to pull them a few days later i might have just waited for them to do it so that way like i'm not involved in this and i really try i i hope to use it as little as possible because i don't want to put myself in this position but sometimes you have to be in this position like sometimes something like this happens where people are you know demanding immediate action oh <laughs> This has really escalated in the course of two minutes. And you look at the problem and you're like, well, I kind of don't like that I'm seeming, that I'm being kind of bullied into a decision like this. But if you look at the, you know, look at the actual. I think he used the word, the, the, the term he was bullied into doing this. That sounds like a pressure group to me. And you're like, well, I kind of don't like that I'm seeming, that I'm being kind of bullied into a decision like this. But if you look at the you know look at the actual situation it's like yeah this actually should be solved like this is a problem this does require action so they're correct like the, pe- the people asking me to do this are correct so it's important not to think defensively in that time and just say okay actually yeah this is right i i should take action and just do it anyway so going back to the original so, topic so the- so 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 wow yeah now that is a chilling clip to me it is he got bullied now it fits within his purview uh, and the lies that yeah, he, he was believes more than in. Happy to do it. Yeah, the lies that he believes in, and he said he looked at it and he said, "Yeah, that clearly violate." No, it didn't. It didn't violate anything. I don't think it violated Apple's terms of service either. Not that it matters, but it is. It just the lie needs to be pointed out. I think there's plenty of stuff you could get Jones on. Wait for something good. You know, wait for something good. Don't don't do it like this. This is stupid. But the purge flows through a lot, and we don't think about this, but uh, here, well, uh, Patreon is now um, closing accounts at the behest of MasterCard. They are they say, hey, MasterCard has said uh, we can't process for this particular uh, podcast or this type of content uh, for, for your Patreon. We're sorry, your account's closed, bye-bye. So that's the power of MasterCard. We did the same with WikiLeaks. And then a dude named Ben, working for a large organization, he just discovered that the firewall we use, Palo Alto Networks, has flagged InfoWars as having questionable content and is now blocked on our internal network. It was never blocked before, so it seems that firewall providers have just jumped on the bandwagon along with Apple, etc. Yeah, that's what happens. It's a it's a domino. I wrote a column about this two weeks ago about cas- censorship yes. of the net. Yeah, it's a cascade, and the blacklisting. Because mm-hmm. yeah. my blog was blacklisted over and over again until I changed the the title line on the HTML. Yeah, from uncensored. Yeah, yeah. So wow. So this, this is this is horrible. So it goes. It it can go pretty deep. Now, what happens at a certain point? Does 
And it's, then where's the neutrality everybody's talking about? Net neutrality. We got Palo Alto Networks well, this, blocking some guy. Well, this is it. This is net neutrality. This is what this is what we would have seen on a massive scale. I think we dodged the bullet. But the, but this this type of uh, and it really is almost a, a an invert. Well, yeah, it's like an inverse of the of the microservices. You know, although it's still human fed. People hear, oh, that guy, ban him. Okay, click. And then it's firewalls that are deployed all you know, across corporations, tens, hundreds of thousands of corporations. Uh, click. It's free Wi-Fi outfits that won't provide it anymore. We've had that happen. And as you said, with your blog, we've had it happen in other ways. My mail server sometimes gets on a blacklist and I have to beg and plead to get taken off so my, my email isn't sent to spam. Um, you know, this this is a little more serious than just getting kicked off of Twitter. Well, hmm, that's really interesting. Well, this is what it is. These guys, I mean, the problem is the tech community somehow turned left some time ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, I never could put my finger on why I can tell you this much. I remember one time going shooting with a CEO from a, one of the, a well-known company. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says to me, he says, uh, whatever you do, don't ever tell anyone you went shooting with me. And I said, oh, yeah, that's like Ray Lane was the same at Kleiner Perkins. Yeah, he didn't want because people would be freaking out that he had guns. Yeah. And so I said, "Okay, I don't have a problem with that. And then he specifically mentioned John Doerr Mm -hmm. as going kind of ape shit at a Halloween party because somebody was. (laughs) <laughs> brought their kid dressed up as a cowboy with a oh, with a god with, with a cap gun. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> so I mean, this is where the, the whole and the whole of uh, Silicon Valley. I mean, the uh, the tech community and the venture capitalists, who are many of whom are billionaires, which is just backing up our thesis that the Democrat Party is the rich party trying to keep everybody down. Which I don't. I mean, it's been forever as long as the black community doesn't recognize that they're going to be forever in the in in trouble. Uh, they just keep everybody in place because you don't want any you know things to get really. You don't want you want to talk a big game and do nothing, which is what seems to be the case with these billionaires. They don't they don't want to have anything, any possibility of losing any money. Right. And so the Democrats always blame the Republicans. Oh, they're making the rich richer and all the rest of it. It's always the Democrats doing that. And and the whole Silicon Valley is all rarely fun. The number of Republicans there is minor. Yeah. It's probably 20 percent. Well, that, well, that was Ray Lane, at, Ray Lane at Kleiner Perkins. Who was the guy who put together the the five hundred million dollar government grant for Fisker? He didn't work in the business after that one. Um, he he went shooting all the time, and he said, "Yeah, I'll talk about it here." And people don't like that so much. John Doerr, he's a card. He, when he was investor in my company, uh, at this one point, he took me aside, and his sixteen year old daughter was completely completely unhinged, and he wanted me to talk to her, see if I could fix her. Like, no, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Yeah, but you understand young people. Uh, no. No, I, I have, I'm not qualified for that, John. Sorry. I'm not qualified. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your courage and say in the morning to you, John C. U N S E stands for R E S P E C T Dvorak. In the morning to you, Mr. Adam Curry. Also, in the morning to all ships at sea, boots on the ground, subs in the water, space force. And all the dames and knights out there. Yes, in the morning to uh, the troll room. Hold on a second. Um, that's interesting. It seems like my website is down. Yeah, you got shut down by the blacklist. It wouldn't surprise me. Hey, troll room, how you doing? Noagendastream.com. You guys are always uh, doing uh, doing good for me and the show, and I appreciate it. Troll Dar, VCO5, Cyborg Dave, Garlic, Occult Fan, Dying Monkey. And there's always Doug. And I also want to say a hearty in the morning to Darren O'Neill, who brought us the episode artwork, the album artwork for 1059. The title of that was Barrel Roll. And this was the roundup bottles with great no agenda font and a star advertising smash pop out sticker that said, now with more cancer. Yeah, it was very good. Very got, good. He's know, done. He's done good work in the past, but he's one of those guys I wanted to mention on this, that 
he's one of those guys. If you look at his, because you can click on the artist and see all their work. Mm-hmm. He's one of those guys like Martin JJ that went probably for more than a year or two without getting anything picked, and he's starting to get a bunch of stuff picked. Yeah, and then all of a sudden he had to stop. He was just getting picked. Well, Martin JJ did. Yeah, yeah. It was too much he was winning. Getting picked every week. <laughs> it was too much winning. <laughs> too much winning. I'm stop. out. Remind me about my curious Monsanto email. I want to say something about that later. Ooh, well, okay, let me write it down. Curious Monsanto email. Yes. I, I think I think they have an army of uh, shills out there trying to convince people. Oh, yeah. Well, of course they do. Well, I think I got one. Oh, well, that's good because they never got a hold of me. Yeah. All right, let's thank a few people for producing and associate executive producing and executive producing show 1060. Yes. Uh, starting with, aha. Now I have to mention there's a, a few, uh, there's a lot, sounds like a lot more in some ways because I hadn't picked up the mail. This is the, this is the mail for three shows. Oh, okay. Gotcha. We got a lot the post of office because yes. I was gone. Yeah. And so Onimus came in, uh, uh, Sir Onimus of Dog Patch in Lower Slobovia with an 888, $888, which marked our eight, eight, the anniversary and everything in between. <laughs> So he says, I'd like to remind listeners to subscribe during these dog patch days of summer. Agree or disagree, this program offers unfiltered analysis of the political for-profit press. Hmm. For-profit is great, but nonstop bias reporting is designed to get listeners to agree. And an agreeable person is more likely to buy the advertised products. Yes. Which is which is the model is what the tr- you try to do. You get people, you find out what, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're nodding their heads. Once they start nodding their heads, you're in. then you sell them something. Yep, you're in. Uh, glitch. <laughs> During a return flight last month, I trans- transited through Dubai. And by the way, I didn't notice any global warming there. <laughs> when I turned on my phone and connected to their service, I received the text, Welcome to Canada. <laughs> I always keep the location off my phone, but does the UAE sometimes turn on its location or turn its location off too? It was a first for me, and I just left me wondering how that could happen. In the eighth month of 2018, and knowing the sum of all our currently printed paper currency is $188, a $100 bill, $50 bill, $20 bill, $10 bill, $5, $2, $1. How could I miss an 888 opportunity? Mm. I also wish to add all the happy Eid al Adha and encourage Adam to try John's goat recipe this month if he hasn't already. <laughs> it's the perfect holiday feast. N J N K is the way he wraps it, as right. usual. Sir Anonymous. So Anonymous is our guy. Thank you very much. And, and thanks. It's great Triple H well, opportunity. I would like for him to come back with his next commentary. And see if he could figure out why it says "Welcome to Canada" <laughs> when he was going to Dubai. <laughs> you never know how that goes. He has some uh, uh, like a little uh, PS at the end, just for me. But he mentions he said just makes this comment at the end about he's talking about social media and how uh, the cookies and all this stuff does work. And he just has this comment. I want to read it. He says basically zip code plus four competes pretty well with cookies and algos but it's just not as sexy. If snail mail didn't work, you wouldn't get so many catalogs. We drop at nine. Follow the rabbit. (laughs) (laughs) All right. He's talking in code, people. Okay. Onward. Um, I'm sorry. I moved. I moved to the email, and I've got to come back. Uh, Scott. uh, Scott and Mary Beth McKay. McKay or Mackey, but it's Mackey, McKay, 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 McKay. 28826 from St. Mary's, Ontario. And uh, we have another note written in here. It's a good, nice donation. It's in Canadian money. So I have to, it's funny when that comes in, you have to send it through collections. <laughs> collections? What are we, yeah, are we, banks, are we repo banks, man now? It's a bank process called uh, collections. Uh, oh, uh, because it has to be settled. Yeah, it has yeah. to be settled. Long live Bitcoin. Bitcoin wouldn't help. Greeting John and Adam. Thank you for your <laughs> Yes, it would. How is it going to well, help? The bank doesn't take it. Never mind. So it has to be settled. I have to convert it. So that's the same thing as what I'm doing with this check. Yeah, okay. Only I'm not. Only the difference is I just give this check to, I say, hey, look, 
settle this. Settle this. Just I give it to them. They do the work. John, With Bitcoin, John, I or you would. Have I'm not. Do. I'm not going to get into it with you. Thank you for your good work, uh, Scott and Mary Wright. I can't tell which is writing. The donations for my son's birthday, August twenty sixth. Mitch McKay, check it out to make sure it's on there. My wife and yeah, I enjoy is. your show. This is our second donation towards my son's knighthood, and you. Uh, can you send some common sense karma to all the politicians here in Scandinavia? It's getting really <laughs> frustrating here, and only bright light seems to be, and the only bright light light seems to be George Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not exactly a politician. Yeah, he's not a politician. Thanks again, Scott and Mary. All right. Uh, I should mention I I wrote an essay in the last newsletter, which I recommend people to look at. And in it, uh, to clarify some, what I was going to discuss, I put a Jordan Peterson paragraph from the wiki page. Yes. And, and so somebody wrote uh, on Twitter says, I stopped reading <laughs> when I saw the Jordan Peterson quote. It wasn't a Jordan Peterson quote. I told quote. you you get pushed back on this. I got, there was a, I don't know how they call that pushback. From but so. it was just it's just a douchebag. Mm. Yeah, so I blocked him. Yeah, because he's uh -huh. like Jordan Peterson is a Nazi. Didn't you know that? <laughs> no, I didn't. Yes. <laughs> Canadian God. Nazi. They're the best. Anonymous, three hundred thirty three dollars. Uh he's anonymous. I'm donating for Sunday after hearing John uh said he was looking into Apple censorship. I love you guys. Uh, I love the show. And both shows are the highlight of my week. For jingles, I would like a random jingle, preferably not Manning or Sharpton. Oh, not. And <laughs> Sorry, I'd queued up a Manning and a Sharpton. I misread it. Okay. <laughs> Keep going. That's funny. Yeah. And plug China Uncensored for its news. Corsi Nation, which is trying to teach citizen journalism. I would like to plug Alex Jones for inspiration, but he doesn't need it due to circumstances. I love uh, the show so much. I'm trying to figure out how to donate a sustaining donation weekly. So to pad your numbers on Sunday, where it seems to be needed the most. Hang in there, guys. You're doing great work despite donations. And as a guy not making much in in tone over, of the overtaxed states in Gitmo Nation, and going to college part time, let's just say money is tight. As one commentator I listen to says, put your money where your mind is, and you guys are worth it. Anyway, karma for all, especially for my friend who hit me in the mouth, and karma in hopes that low unemployment will eventually raise wages to something livable for us slaves. Here, here. Uh, I would like you guys to take uh, on a homebrew theory of mine with inspiration from you guys, Jones, and a few other journal. Journalist sources. I'm just hoping I'm nuts. Oh, I haven't seen this. I'll, I'll look at the link. And, and before we continue, I forgot to give out the uh, Canadian politician karma. Let's do that first. Ah, Canadian politician. You've got karma. It's powerful. Powerful. Uh, yeah. And so right. this guy needs this guy needs some random clips and karma for everybody. Right, let's see what I got for you. <laughs> <laughs> These are pigs. Save the world. You've got karma. Okay. Um, onward. Baron Nettes, you'll check out that link and tell me if it's any, in, mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. Baron Nettes, Susan Johnson, and Newberg. She's a, for, our associate executive producer for today's show. $280. And she sent in a note. Lots of notes. ITM, John and Adam, around April, I asked for house selling karma. And I'm now in the middle of moving. I'm moving to Hillsboro. Oh. Hillsboro, Oregon, which is a wine growing area, by the way. One of the first I've ever is heard of. Is that near the about. Willamette Village of, uh, Valley? I don't know that it is. Okay. Maybe somebody can look it up real quick. I just quick. always order wine from the Willamette Valley because that's how you pronounce it. Willamette. Yeah, Willamette. If you yeah, say I've, been, I've cruised through that area. It's very... Very, very interesting wine growing community. Mitchell Kaufman, the Grand Duke of the Pacific Northwest, and the rest wait, of wait, you. Wait, what happened the... to Baronessus? That was it? No, he's. she just said she's moving to Hillsboro. Oh, she didn't need karma for that? No, I'm, I'm still reading the note. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Mitchell Kaufman, the Grand Duke of the Pacific Northwest, uh, and the rest of you in the it. Portland area, it's time for a meetup. I get it now. Okay. This donation is for Sir American Carnage, whose birthday is the 18th. He will be turning 28. As always, thank you for doing what you do, Baronetis Susan Johnson, soon to be of, not to be of Newburgh, but of Hillsboro. Okay. Okay. Uh, throw some karma out for her. You got it. Moving karma. You've got karma. Charles Pell, a.k.a. Sir Optitious, in Mankato, Minnesota. 260-59. Charles, it's actually pronounced Peel. Charles Peel from Mankato, Minnesota, a.k.a. Sir Optitious. Surreptitious. Surreptitious. Get it? Yes. Cheap ass night of the 10th anniversary show. Since it's my birthday today and I had a minor mention on show 1058, I figured it was a sign that I was overdue for another donation. 260.59 is $5 a week for another year of fantastic shows, plus another 59 cents for my age today. Hmm. All right. I always say, uh, it's a good, good bit. Mm-hmm. I always keep. Uh, one podcast in reserve for entertainment while mowing the lawn. My neighbors probably think I'm nuts as I ride around the yard on my mower laughing and commenting to myself <laughs> about the show. <laughs> we need video. <laughs> keep up the shows. Keep the shows coming, gentlemen. I would love to hear the old classic Don't Look Over Here and Words Do Matter jingles along with some general goat karma. Thank you. Don't look over here. Nothing to see here. Ooh, look at that. Because words do matter. You've got <laughs> karma. Austin Wilson, $233.33 from Sammamish, Washington. Uh, hi, John and Adam. Keep up the great dis- deconstruction of the M5M. I'd like job karma for my wife, Laura. We would have been at the Seattle meetup last week, but we were da- out of town. Looks like it was ha- it was a great time for all. Jobs, 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 and jobs. Let's vote for jobs. Yeah! You thought karma. Uh, okay, one word to uh, Jeremy. I'm looking up. I have to look at his email. Is okay? Great, um, Jeremy Toth. Two twenty-two twenty-two. Oh, you have it mail. already. You have it. You have it. I have it. Yeah, I, I, I was sneaking it in there. <laughs> I had I had the squirrel I mail about ready. The jingle. Otherwise, I would have made a bigger deal out of it. <laughs> yeah, well, let's just do that over again. Yeah. Do you have the, the note there, that, John? I don't think this is going to happen a lot. Yeah. But Gentlemen, you- that should be effectively de douche me following as much deserved call out from fellow producer Alan Sibley a few shows back. You've been de douched. It's a race to the ring now, Sibley. <laughs> Sibley. 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 Please send out some very special human resource karma for my good friends Phil and Ali Schumacher as Baby One is scheduled to drop today. <laughs> <laughs> Got a new release what dropping she today, everybody. In the fields? <laughs> she working in the music in the music business? Whatever better gift could I ever bestow than <laughs> arranging virtual aspiration from Uncle Uncle's crackpot and buzzkill? Hey, hey. If I can also ask for some house selling buying karma for myself, I would appreciate it greatly. Amen. Thank you both for so much what you do. Finding your show many years ago and listening faithfully ever since has impacted me to an extent that my entire trajectory has been altered oh i'm eternally very grateful for that and owe you both a portion a portion of something for my sanity well thank you very much i I appreciate hearing that he says uh, your biggest mouth hitter in grand rapids michigan all right uh so we got human resource drop in karma and some house karma for him was that what it was that's what it looks like yeah You've got karma. And now we have, uh, and this one I haven't gotten to. Let's see if can do. There it is. <laughs> He's off to the squirrel mail, ladies and gentlemen. Looking for that donation note. Can he find it before the jingle's over? 
He can because he gets no spam. His name is the one and only John C. Dvorak. <laughs> well, well, curiously. You don't have it? <laughs> <laughs> Let me try something. Hold on a second. <laughs> yeah, no, it's wow, funny. that's fail. It's yeah, Dave, it's man. It's Dave. Fugazato. Yeah, put, oh, maybe it's Dave. Is it it's, it's Dave, not it's, David? It's Dave. Oh, Dave's say. not here. Fugazato. Okay, Let's see. Well, I, I, I can't keep always spelling it. Without looking right at it, I can't. I'm not obviously spelling Fugazato right. correctly. Here it is. Gentlemen, and closes my latest contribution to further your ongoing mission. By the way, that's da 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 da, da outlook. Okay. Enclosed is my latest contribution to further your ongoing mission of media deconstruction. Excuse the length of the comments below, but thanks for indulging us, members of the peerage. We started a new academic year in preparation for a teaching lesson on communication. I came across a note on the importance of listening and specifically how difficult it is to be a good listener. One of my most in, one of the most important aspects of the No Agenda show is that it helps me be a better listener. I am forced to pay close attention to get the most out of each show, and the lingering effects of the no agenda mindset also improves my critical thinking skills. And by the way, I don't think it works so well when you're running it at one and a half or two times speed. I or, agree. Or the people have it where it chops out the spaces in between. Oh, I don't even know about that. Yeah, it's like ruining my art. Second, I had an experience with one of the phone banks reminding me to vote last week. I was amused because he made sure to tell me to get out and cast a vote for two specific candidates, one of whom's last name he didn't know. I asked where he was calling from, and he wasn't even in the same state. I told him he didn't give me much confidence with his lack of knowledge and conveyed this to his supervisor as well. Probably not his fault, as he was likely just a kid trying to buff up his college fund with a summer phone bank job. Still, the lack of attention to detail was telling and the experience tracked closely with the discussion last show. Yep. I, get, I get a lot of these types of calls, mostly for the guy who previously had that number. I always use it as a chance to hit people in the mouth, and I always ask Emily's list for good HVAC recommendations. They love it! <laughs> 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 Keep up the superb deconstruction. Thanks for your courage. Yeah, when you... You know, that's an interesting idea. When you get one of those, you know... I get lots of phone calls. No matter, you know, it, if you uh, if you press three to be put on their do not call list, your phone is ringing all day. By the way, it's just this yeah, huge no, it's a, it's scam. A horrible, horrible scam. See, where's Elizabeth Warren when when we need her? She's obviously yeah, she she's a promised. Pony. Yeah. But anyway, you know, I think it's a good idea. It's like, hey, is this uh, d- is this Adam Curry? I would say, who's calling? I was like, why are you calling? Nah. Do you listen to the No Agenda Show? It's gonna be my next line. Do you listen to the No Agenda it Show? Should be yeah. Let's see if that works. Maybe it can hit some people in the mouth. Well, what I do, and I've done this, uh, I don't do it as much because I'm usually annoyed, so I don't remember to do it as much as I should, but I do it. I said, you got it. I said, she said, you know, whoever's telling you to buy something or do something. I said, do you have a pen? Do you have a pen and paper? I got, I got to tell you something. <laughs> this is great. And, she, and they said, yeah, I got a pen. I got paper. I said, write this down. www.noagendashow.com. You should listen to this show because it'll, you won't be able to. You won't have these horrible jobs like this uh, if you just pay some attention to, you know, maybe get back to a, a real reality. So just give it a shot. And then they just so baffled, and then I hang up. Good idea. I like making them write it down. That's excellent. Yeah, if they excellent. do, they might be writing in the excellent. sky for all you know. I mean, these guys. Yeah, it doesn't but, matter. It's still funny. Still funny. Write all it right. Down. Onward. Onward. Thomas Wolfarth. In Hendersonville, North Carolina, $200. A lot of North Carolinians coming in today. Uh, the newsletter today reminded me of the value I received from the show and that while I do have a monthly 1111 for years and re- recently moved to 3333, it's unacceptable that I'm not a knight yet. I'm still not, but as I've been saying for years, I soon will be. Please throw on a karma with a T-B-I-T-U at the end of this donation section for you and all the other producers. Thank you very much, Thomas, and I look forward to uh, your ceremony. You will get there, no doubt about it. You've got karma. Well, stay on the air until you do. Sir John Helmer in Shawnee, Kansas. Shawnee, Shawnee, Kansas. The recent No Agenda shows have been excellent. John's abrasiveness aside, 
<laughs> Thank you for your tireless efforts to deconstruct the M5M. Can I get a L. Sharpton dealer choice? Foamer? Goat Scream Karma, Sir John. Uh, yes, you can. But resist, we much. We must and we will much about that be committed. Oh, my God! Woo! Listen to that horn! <laughs> You've got... <sighs> Karma. Apparently a new favorite amongst the ringtone crowd. <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah. Seems to work well for them, I'm reliably informed. Nice. I might, that sounds like a good ringtone to try out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was, that's it. Yeah, that's it. I want to thank all these folks, especially the executive producers and associate executive producers, which are all, all these folks for helping produce show uh, 1060. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, these titles that you've received today are real titles. So your executive producership or your associate executive producership is valid. You can put it on your resume, your LinkedIn profile, which uh, does seem to work. People are getting jobs. Go ahead and take a look. Look for No Agenda uh, producers on LinkedIn. You'll see that they are experiencing jobs. I think think that's what it says. Uh, and uh, we appreciate you keeping the, the ship running and the uh, the show on the road. We'll be thanking more people who came in at $50 or above in our second segment. And a reminder, we have another show on Sunday. We can always use your support at Dvorak.org slash NA, or as we'd like to sing it, Dvorak.org slash NA. Not only do we deconstruct for you, we make you feel better and give you life-saving tips. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth. Shut up, Shut up, Slade. Shut up, So you have this thesis that I've, I've subscribed to, which is that people say things on podcasts they normally don't say. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of these um, video interview podcasts by wannabe interviewers, and many of them are very well produced. Uh-huh. Now, there's one guy I discovered is Patrick Bet. I think it's Patrick Bet Dash David, mm-hmm. who interviews a lot of very interesting and many shady characters. And he did. I have four clips. Whoa. That I can make, I can play one, two, or many. But I'll give him. A, I'm going to start with a teaser of the of these of this group. This is Michael Franzesi, who is a ex mobster in the Colombo crime family. When the Kennedys were coming up, his father was not the most Bootleg. straight. You know, he okay, was. A, you so know, I'm going to set this up. Hold on, back off. Um, <laughs> hey, man, don't tell me to back, back off, off when you just told me to come <laughs> in. Hey, what's wrong with you? The, yeah, but when I said I wrote set up at the end of the clip, which is the idea, he's talking about his dad, who was a majorly, majorly famous um, mobster, and his dad, who's still alive at a hundred. Which, in fact, he was just released from prison recently at 100 years wow. old. Wow. Uh, and he appeared, and he was a big shot during the Genovese era, The you know, all, when all the families were like all together before they all got taken down by various RICO actions. Until they got and into he, drugs and ruined the business. And, and so he's talking in this case, in this zero clip, he's talking about Donnie Brasco and the fact that it took out like 100 mobsters. That, and it was made into a movie with Johnny Depp. And who is he? Uh, Donnie he, he, He's a, a, a law enforcement officer. Who? Jo- Donnie. D- Brasco. Well, it was a different guy. That was his name. I think he went by right, in the uh, as he went. He played a gangster. He was an undercover guy who who's, was undercover with the mob for six ah. years. Yeah. And it, the mob was very upset about it. And now he's relating. Uh, I'm sorry. He's talking about Brasco here and and how this one group of criminals got careless and let him in and then he took the the whole group down and a lot of other people and it was very very disappointing and then he says he almost had a similar experience of of some creeps coming in and but but he avoided it and there's a piece of information in here that explains something to me you know you get a guy like lefty or you get some of those guys that are really not earnest big earners Mm -hmm. and you get somebody that's earning can put a few bucks in their pocket they get a little sloppy they don't look that far back and i'll tell you i had that experience too 
Okay, I get contacted in the middle. It was a huge case. They called it shadow boxing. I get contacted by a guy that was uh, with Muhammad Ali. The FBI took him out of prison and put him in this undercover operation, along with an FBI agent that went undercover. His name was Victor Quintana. And he allegedly was a drug dealer at one point in time. They cleaned up his act but had a ton of money, wanted to get into the fight business. So they come to me. Can you introduce us to Don King? I'm with these people for eight months, okay? All the while, they're recording everything that I do. I had like 83 recordings on me. I take them finally through Al Sharpton. Al Sharpton <laughs> was a gun for hire. I worked with him a lot, all right? And I make Al Sharpton set up a meeting with Don King to bring these two guys to meet King. So we go there, and first I check out. The FBI had set up a bank account. They had $15 million in a bank in the Midwest. The FBI set it up. Yeah, yeah. So I bring them to King. We're in King's office. I go in there first. I said, Don, let me tell you something. I know these guys seven or eight months. They're high rollers. They're driving a Rolls Royce. We went to Florida together. They want to meet you. I said, but I don't know them past that. I said, so when we talk in here, everything's got to be legit. Don't say anything wrong. Everything legit. Let me keep looking for mm -hmm. them. And the meeting went great. Bottom line is, uh, they were asking for more money to continue the operation. The FBI said no, because after a year, they could, still couldn't do anything. And then the whole thing fell apart. And we found out later that it was an undercover operation. Sports Illustrated did wow. a huge, huge deal on it. Uh, Al Sharpton, the rev, the, the, the connector. Al on the coast. He'll take so care I look, of you. I look at, into this. Uh, he actually call him a hitman. Huh. Uh, and they did dissolve this operation. I read that article, and then it was written in 91, and it was about this, this shadow boxing uh, undercover sting. And what comes out of it was is the following timeline. This uh, undercover sting took can I, can place I ask, in Can I ask a question, just because uh, I don't understand? Uh, shadow boxing. What, when you, you say that, I don't understand what that means. Well, he said that was the code name for the undercover ah, operation. Okay, got it. So he, uh, that was what the FBI called it. And he said that in that clip. Okay. Uh, anyway, so you look into this, and this thing took place from uh, 88, 89, or I'm sorry, 82 to 83. And it ended, they ended it. And he, the way he says it, uh, he understands that they ran out of money and they weren't going to keep this thing going. I don't believe that's what happened. What happened at the point, that is the point where L. Sharpton became an informant for the FBI. Mm hmm. Because uh, if you look into L. Sharpton, FBI informant, he became an informant in 83, which was right after this event. I think the FBI went in there to trying to, you know, bust these other guys, right. including Don King. And, and they, then they, and they of, found L. Sharpton like what a what a gem. They found L. Sharpton, who was very well connected, I guess. And they used him, and in fact, it was Al Sharpton who was responsible for bringing down the Genovese gang. Ah. And I'm ah. wondering why he's still alive. And number two, huh. what's he doing at MSNBC? He still has a weekend show there. How did he get that job? Was it the FBI that said we should place him someplace? Do you think he has clearance? I'll bet I'd he like does. To know. I'll bet he does. Interesting. Something very I, suspicious about that guy. I like I like this. I thought you'd get a kick out of that one. Yeah. Now <laughs> this is on YouTube? This is some some just some dude? Yeah. Yeah, you can find it. He's he doesn't have uh, a broadcast deal? Not that I know of. Sign him up. Now I got a cup. I got three other th things. One is about the corruption. Francesi goes on just a clip too about the corruption. I'm not gonna. I don't necessarily want to play it. About the FBI says is more corrupt now than it ever has wait, wait, been. So that, that's all we have on uh, on Sharpton. Yeah, that's all. It was just been passing as though, as a matter of fact, he was just a man for. <laughs> let's, let, let, for us. let's just all remember. There's no real conflict. Just remember, there's no real conflict. Uh, I got one. He talks about the Kennedy election being a, a, done by the mob and how they the mob assassinated Kennedy. Yes, which is yes, like, yes. Let's listen. Not the CIA, the mob. That's what he says. Before process issues, that'd be a very interesting person to be talking. About. He goes back to the days of Luciano and Costello. Oh my and gosh. He, he'll even he's tell you about, about his dad. What? He's talking about his dad. Okay. Capone, because he was younger then, but he knew Capone came out of New York. So he knows right he did of, stuff with Capone? Absolute, uh, well, he knew him. I'm not saying, I don't know what he, exactly what yeah. he did, but he knew him. I asked my dad, I'm going to tell you this. 
my dad was, uh, he, he got so much publicity in his 60s. Now, he wasn't the main guy around, okay? There was a lot of guys doing it. Columbia, everybody was around. But for some reason, they targeted my dad. Now, I got to tell you this story. Are you sure? So they, hold on. I went stop, to, stop, stop. Is this clip one? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were jumping ahead. No, it's not. No, I, the Kennedy election. That's what we're talking about. An assassination clip. Oh, but I see what I did wrong. Okay, apologies. I Star take Lord. all of that back. When the Kennedys were coming up, his father was not the most Bootleg. straight. You know, he was a, you know, he, he, Joseph Kennedy, he was a big part of the market manipulation. I think when Roosevelt hired him to bring him in and say, listen, what do we need to do here? And they, they came out with fingerprinting for licensing. The guy came out with SEC. So he was very much involved in 100%. knowing how to manipulate the marketplace. He was involved with the mob based on some of the stories you read about. Strong personality. So then you read and say, well, the mob helped Kennedy get elected. I don't know that. I'm asking you. So my first question is, is the answer to that yes? And two, once Kennedy got elected, the follow-up is, it's been said that once he got elected, they try to distance themselves from the mob to, to look like they were good so nothing would happen. The mob got upset about it. And when they got upset about it because they couldn't fulfill their commitments they made to the mob, the mob said, we got to do something about it. And they went about doing what they did to hire who they hired to shoot him and then et cetera. When he walked off, the mob killed him. Now, this is some of the stories. Obviously, hmm. a lot of this is conspiracy. But one of the best conspiracies to read about is Kennedy. People are so fascinated by it. Having said that, what do you know about the JFK uh, situation there? Well, understand, my father is through that whole era, and many of the guys that I knew were through that whole era. So all I ever heard, and that I know to be true, okay, and there's no upside in me saying this. I, I'm not writing a book about it, nothing. But there's no question that Joe Kennedy was involved with. He was a bootlegger. You're not going to... no question. No question. Okay. And I know for a fact that somebody wanted to kill Joe um, Kennedy during those times because I heard that he was robbing money, wasn't doing the right thing, and his life was spared. Okay. This is 40s? This is 30s? This is, this in, is in the 50s? 40s, 50s, okay. during that era. Got it. He was a bootlegger. You're not a bootlegger unless you're dealing with us guys. That's it. Okay. No question also. Okay, that uh, through his father, uh, John Kennedy was, we wanted him in the White House, and he was a connection as far as we were concerned. So, yes, through Chicago, through Louisiana, um, he was, they did help him get elected. They did help Absolutely. him get elected. Union votes and so you on. You know oh, yeah. about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know this for a fact. Okay, got okay? it. And now, the government's never going to want anybody to know this. They're going to call me a liar and all that kind of stuff, but that's the truth, Patrick. And as far as uh, the assassination... I mean, come on. Did Jack Ruby come out of nowhere? I mean, he had all of a sudden these mob ties didn't mean anything. If you had mob ties with me, they would want to say it all over the world. Oh, you're, you're connected with the mob. All of a sudden, Ruby, who was connected with the mob, not as saying he wasn't, you know? They never want it to be known that the mob had a hand in that assassination because it makes them look horrible. The government doesn't want anybody to know that. But, I mean, I've heard that consistently throughout my, my whole tenure in that life, all the time. You know, Giancana in Chicago and... and uh, so when he got killed, you're saying the assassination is linked back to the mob? Yes. Now, again, it's been said, yeah, it's not true, he's a liar. I have no upside in saying this other than this is what I know to be true throughout my whole time in that life. I heard it from my father. I heard it from everybody that I know that was in that era. I was there. I was younger, obviously. I mean, I wasn't coming up at that time, but, but it was shortly after. I mean, I, be, I got recruited in the 70s. It was a couple of years after he was killed. So that story was fresh. Now, nah, forget about it. Now, he has another story. I don't have everything he said because he, has, he knows where Hoffa's buried. Isn't he buried in the Meadowlands in New Jersey? Yeah, he says that's definitely not it. <laughs> and what he finally, he kind of, he wouldn't say what the details, but what you could deconstruct it. And it, it sounds as if Hoffa was given some cement boots and dropped off in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, day wrecker. Yeah, pushed in the plot without the plane. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Out of a plane? <laughs> yeah, well, that's how you get him in the middle of the Atlantic. Maybe they pushed him off a boat, but yeah. I think it was a plane. Nice. Okay, now the last one is the, is the one of, that we was talking about his dad again. And this story is the real, and he even kind of hints that his dad was kind of full of shit with his stories. But he kind of says this story sounds kind of true because his dad was really targeted by the Justice Department over a lot of these other mobsters. Right. And uh, he 
for all these years, you can never figure out why. And so this story, which is clip three, comes out. Before process issues, that'd be a very interesting person to be talking about. He goes back to the days of Luciano and Costello. Oh, my and gosh. He, he'll even tell you about Capone because he was younger then, but he knew Capone came out of New York. So he knows right he out did of, stuff with Capone? Uh, well, he knew him. I'm not saying, I don't know what he, exactly what yeah. he did, but he knew him. I asked my dad, I'm going to tell you this. My dad was, uh, he, he got so much publicity in his 60s. Now, he wasn't the main guy around, okay? There was a lot of guys doing Columbus, everybody was around. But for some reason, they targeted my dad. And I got to tell you this story. So I went to him one time. I said, Dad, Dad. why you? Why you? There was a lot of guys around. Why did they pick you? He said, my mom has passed away five years ago. And he said, I never wanted to tell you this. I don't want to disrespect your mom. But now that your mom has passed away, I'm going to tell you. I said, what? He said, I was dating Marilyn Monroe. Kennedy fell in love with her, Bobby Kennedy. He was the attorney general at the time. She made him understand that she was in love with my father. From that point on, Robert Kennedy targeted my dad because of the Marilyn Monroe. Went after him like crazy. Now, sometimes my dad will, you know, I'm wondering, okay, dad, you're trying to make... But it made sense. I said, dad, you telling me? He says, I swear so your to God. dad was with Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, and he got a little bit more graphic when he told me the story. I'm not going to repeat it here. But... But yeah, and then, you know, I'm starting at that. And I said, where did you meet her? Now I start questioning him. He, he says, I, I met her at the star club. That was the hot place back yeah. then, right? Costello had a piece of it. And I said, okay, tell me how it happened. He'd tell me the whole setup and everything else. And, you know, because Hoover wasn't targeting mob guys back then. That's you know right. Why? He was a friend because you had information on him on the I inside. had information. Yeah. He was bisexual. Yep. And, you know, he got caught and blah, blah, blah. So he never went after guys because yeah. they held it over his he head. He actually said there is no mob is what he, he said. He said there is no yeah. mob, right? <laughs> but Kennedy was a different story. And he targeted my dad for that reason. You know what? Sometimes I think my dad, but I believe this one. I absolutely believe it because I put it two together. I did my little research. It was true. Wow. This is great. And this is on a, on a YouTube. That's pretty good. Yeah. I There's like stuff that. out there. I like that. And what's this? What's this? You going to want to play this last clip or not? Well, the last clip is kind of just it's, it's a it's a lightweight clip compared to the other three. But yeah, play it. So let me ask you: as dirty as politics was back then, how dirty is it today? More or less? Patrick, I have never. I, and now I understand something. Yeah, did I see them when we were on the street? We understood the government a lot of times crossed the lines with us. We got it. But you know what? We were criminals. So in a way, can you justify it? I don't think so. I don't think the government is ever supposed to act illegally. Okay, they're supposed to abide by the law. We were criminals. We broke the law. But they're supposed to use the laws effectively and, and properly to get anybody. That's my feeling. But you know what? All right, we were criminals, and they crossed the line every once in a while. Okay. I have never in my lifetime seen the level of corruption that is going on t today in the political Come arena. on. I, I, Patrick, I, I kid you not. More today than before. Hunter, absolutely. And at a level that I can't believe. I mean, look, I've experienced, this is my life experience. You gotta understand, I've been indicted five times. I've had two federal racketeering cases. I've had two state racketeering cases. I, I, I've been in front of the Supreme Court on constitutional issues in my dad's case. I've been in front of the appellate court so many times. I've been more grand juries than you can imagine. This has been my life. I understand it. I know the law. And I am telling you, I've never seen the law violated by people in power like I'm seeing now. It's to a point where I can't even watch it anymore. It, it's, it's terrible because it's bad for all of America. Look, we <laughs> cannot let our political... You know, it's bad when the gangster, <laughs> the gangster says it's bad, man, over there. <laughs> ...authorities cross those, the lines of, 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 of what's legally correct. We can't let them do that because it's a threat to everyone at that point in time. And I'm not being biased. I have many friends in law enforcement, many friends, and they're honest con. They'll tell you straight out, we don't approve of what's going on. Retired FBI agents that I know now are sickened to what they see now. Wow. I mean, come on. This is. I mean, look. I mean, even Comey, what is going on in his book tour? I mean, the, the things that he's saying that are coming out of his mouth, it's an embarrassment to the FBI, in my opinion. Because there's a lot of hardworking, you know, honest, legitimate agents that do their job. And a guy like this, in my opinion, is tainting everything else. Wait I mean, a it's terrible. I mean, did he work for the feds as well? No. No, he never did. <laughs> That's really... Uh, John, bend over. Well-deserved. Clip of the day.
I'll just lump it all into one. I like it. I think it's a, that was a good collection. I, I Very came good. Up with that. I agree. Oh, man. I hope they don't. Uh, I mean, he said something bad about Al Sharpton. He'll probably get purged from the platform. <laughs> this is a bad idea to be talked. Don't put that on your platform. All right. Let's shift gears for a sec. Just some light, some light stuff. Local story. Local story. I told you that this, that this happened and I have some proof. Uh, uh, Austin, Texas, now gone so crazy that in the city council meetings, we no longer clap. We snap our fingers like beatniks, man. Like beatniks because it's really hey, good. Hey, you man. Stop. You can stop. I'm, I'm going to tell you something. This is bull crap. What is? There is no way that what you're saying, because you told me this already. We usually don't do stuff on the show where we've talked about it before. I am not buying it. If you, if I'm going to buy it, then I got to bring the bongos out. Okay, so let's do this. I have two clips. I have one from the incident that I was told about, and I have t- the second one is from just uh, two nights ago, and I'll explain that as well. So you okay, can man. then so listen first because it's at the very end, oh, right? Man, so don't play your refer. bongos. Because you will Refer. miss it. Because it's because you know everyone's talking. It's just short. It's short, short, short. Briefer. This is the Diversity Council, uh, part of the Austin City Council. This was regarding the name change, I believe, because the founder of Austin, Texas, had slaves. Therefore, we need to be change our oh, name yeah. to Ouch. shithole. Apparently, uh, this is going on in Canada with the founder of Canada. Ah, oh, racist. Get rid of him. So you'll hear it at the very end. While I do think that my prime responsibility and the main thing that I will continue spending my time on is helping folks survive and addressing inequality in our community, um, I do think that uh, having something for folks to feel proud of and come together around and want to stay in Austin for um, is, is something that our council should continue working on and considering. And so that's why, given all of this work, I'll uh, feel comfortable voting yes on this deal. Thank you. Any further discussion? <laughs> Did you hear it? Did you hear it? Are you kidding me? Let's listen to just the other night uh, as the MLS soccer stadium has been approved for building in Austin, Texas. The soccer team. Oh, hold on a second. What's the name uh, of the Austin soccer team? Oh, they're, they're getting them from, uh, I think, Ohio. It's, uh, no, they're, they're I think one they're, lined up. I think they're called MLS, actually. Right, here we go. That's now again at the end. So wait with the bongos. The soccer team is paying for, and they're building a stadium, and then they're giving it to us for free, and then they're paying us rent to use it. They're delivering significant, important, and much-needed community benefits. There are no public subsidies, and because the most probable public alternative use for this property is affordable housing, there's no loss of property tax revenue. I want to thank the staff for pretty exceptional work and working through this issue. Thank you. Thanks to the community for the engagement, my colleagues for working through a pretty difficult issue. The city is excited about Major League Soccer. I am too. I can't wait until we are all wearing the same jersey, celebrating the first championship in Austin. Are we ready to vote? Councilmember Garza. There you go. More finger snapping. That is unbelievable. Why is it unbelievable? What's stupid? That's no, why. Okay, that's that's different. That's not the same as unbelievable. Live in Austin long enough, you believe. Now that it's also the very discriminatory. I mean, to the point where I think it's close to being bigoted. Uh, because you're going to ask me how's that? How how going? does that work, John? How are you bigoted for finger Some snapping? Some people cannot snap their fingers. You know. Good point. Some people cannot snap their fingers. It's bigoted. Bigoted, bigoted, bigoted. What's really bigoted now, is... Now, if they allow bongos into the chamber, that'd be great. <laughs> What's really bigoted is that uh, you heard it there in the clip. Hey, it was just intended for affordable housing. Screw those people. Soccer. Yeah, that was funny, by the way. Soccer. <laughs> that was funny. And I want to... Was... The irony of that clip was them saying, you know, eh. I would like Affordable to... housing. And... I'm not buying that they're give, getting the stadium for free, plus they're going to pay a rent. It's a stupid thing to do, and although I grew up in football-loving territory and love the footballs, soccer, 
as a sport is un-American. It's an un-American sport because you can't put commercial breaks in. It's un-American, this soccer. So I don't know why they're all for it. You can't well, make money crawlers. on it. You can't make money on it in America. Yeah, the break problem is really an issue. Yeah, no, it's the issue. It's the only reason why football, soccer, has not made it in America. Because we can't break for commercials. The Austin Beatniks will soon be taking place at the... The uh, Austin Beatniks. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Ned. The Austin Beatniks. I'm writing that down. I'm writing it down, too. The Austin Beatniks. Nice. Hey, let's do a little more Trump hate. Oh, okay, great. Trump hate is always good. Uh, you know, the, the Antifa rally in Washington, D.C., I just uh, pulled a quick little clip of their chant. Okay, <laughs> There you go. No borders, no wall, no USA at all. I think this is really the, the highlight of all these guys. The no border, no borders, no walls, no USA at all. Yeah. Uh, or actually, it's wall singular, so it rhymes better. Yeah. So Bernie was on Colbert. Yes. And, you know, he asked, and Colbert tried to make it interesting. Colbert, had, you can play this if you want. It's, it's Bernie answering the question, what is Democrat socialist? And Bernie's answer is bull crap. And, of course, Colbert never did anything about the no borders, no walls, no USA at all, which is part of the program according to did he uh, did he promote his girl uh aoc yeah, oh oh yeah t- constant i want to say something about I think that she's blowing him i want <laughs> john c dvorak i'm shocked don't what do you think no 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 maybe a fondle um i want to uh, say something i'm i'm seeing uh like uh, Dana Lash and all these types of people, you know, these Twitter, the right wing Twitter stars everywhere laughing. And they're, they're kind of standard now. We want her, please, please. We want her to run. We want more of her. This is great. She's fantastic. We can't get enough. She's so hilarious. Let me tell you, that's what they said about Donald Trump. Be very yeah. careful what you wish for. Be yeah, very, very careful. Because just because she she's a blithering idiot, and I don't mean that she's not intelligent, she is not schooled. She can get the schooling. She can get the answer. She can be told how to talk. We had a president that did this. So be very and she has everything else going for her. Yeah. Crazy eyes, big 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 smile. Yeah, big mouth. Lots I mean, be very careful. This is the type of actor, and I say that in a literal sense, who could really get somewhere. So I'm just that was just my little warning. Bernie, I, um, I'm on your side with this. Yeah, not that I wouldn't mind because it would be great for our show. I would I would look forward to that. But let's hear about it from uh, the Bernster. There's Andrea Ocasio-Cortez, like there, and both of you identify as democratic socialists. What is that? What is that? mean? Well, I think it means, among other things, that if you work 40 hours a week in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, you should be earning a living wage 15 bucks an hour. That's what it means. That's what it means. It, it <laughs> means, it means, Stephen, it means that we end the international disgrace of the United States being the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people as a right notice we end up spending. Notice how it's now gone to a uh, major country. It used to be in the developed West, you know, in the West. It used to be developed world. Uh, now it's just major company. Uh, country. Country. Yeah. country. Just, any, just any major country. Yeah. It's not true. The international disgrace of the United States being the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people as a right while we end up spending twice as much per capita on health care as any other major nation. Woo! Bernie! It, it means that we understand that the future of this country are our young people 
and that it is insane that hundreds of thousands of bright young kids cannot afford to go to college because of the income of their families and many others are leaving school deeply in debt and we're going to make public colleges and universities tuition free. And it, and it means that as global citizens, people who understand that we have a moral obligation to leave a healthy planet to our children and grandchildren, we're going to stand up to Trump and we're going to transform our energy system in this country <laughs> away from fossil fuel <laughs> to energy efficiency Whoa! and sustainable energy. That's what it means. people other people have espoused those ideas without calling themselves socialists ever since the the new deal and certainly since the great society the democratic party has been associated with the social safety net and been essentially been socialism curious but why <laughs> why do you need to call yourself socialist because that has such that's freighted with so much negativity in the I'll, united I'll states tell you why. I, Okay, I'm just saying that like people are very excited about Ocasio Cortez. I've had her in the seat; she's very impressive. But the people that she campaigned for did not win their primaries. Only half the people you campaigned for won their primaries okay. so far. So maybe, maybe there's a little there's a little taint to socialism that turns people taint. off. I don't really think so. I, I think the real issue is that the ideas that we have been talking about, almost without exception, Stephen, are now ideas that are mainstream ideas that are supported by the vast majority of the American people. Uh, and I think also people in their gut understand that we're living in a really strange moment in American history above and beyond Donald Trump, which is very strange. <laughs> What's stranger than Donald Trump? What is well, stranger? What, I, what this is what might be <laughs> might be stranger is that we're looking at a time where we have an out of control capitalism, where the greed <laughs> of the people on top is really unbelievable. I mean, out of control. Right now, right now in America, you got three people who own more wealth than the bottom fifty percent of the American people. You got the top one tenth of one percent owning more wealth than the bottom ninety percent. You got one guy, Jeff Bezos of Amazon. His wealth is increasing every single day by two hundred and fifty million dollars a day, but he pays his workers, many of his workers, wages that are so low that many of them are on food stamps or Medicaid. Whew. Wow. I'm tired after we're hearing all that. Yes, I, I had to cut it short. He went on for another five minutes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Why, you know, it baffles me. Why don't you just say, hey, I'm a socialist. It's socialism. It's good. Just just go. Everyone's couching and you're like, well, you know, it's not really the right brand. You know, what it's going to be is we're going to change the definition of socialism just like we've changed the definition of racism. And that's fine as long as we understand what it is. You can call it whatever you want. The meaning, you know, gay is not does not have the same meaning as it used to. So I'm okay with that. But let's all agree on what it really means. What it really means yeah. is what Nancy Pelosi, by the way, I think she, just in time for the midterm, she got her face job. She got a new facelift done. Have you seen oh, her this recently? This will have to be the last. This will have to be the oh, last. Oh, no, it's definitely, it's definitely the last. But if she has another facelift, she's going to end up with a goatee. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, I know something about facelifts. My first wife had a couple. That's why I always say some bruising for a couple of days. It'll be fine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> She's had major work done, and it's so everything's so tight still because she's in a recovery stage that she's actually clicking a little bit now. She's clicking because she can't quite control oh, her. because she can't move her mouth? Yep, yep, yep. She yep. has to talk like this. She's going to sound like pretty much kind of like groupy dog. Yeah, that's a good. And by the way, I have nothing against facelifts. You do whatever you want. You can put your head it's upside your face. down. It's your face. Yeah. It's your platform. <laughs> my face is my platform. I'm Adam Curry. My face is my platform. Uh, here she is with some stuff about uh, the president. He's a racist. Um, of what happened. And listen to her slur. In Charlottesville. What are, you, what are your reflections when you're out? It's so terribly sad that year has gone by quickly, uh, but it has not diminished 
the sorrow this is for our country with going backward. And the uh, president, with all of his statements, he's the master of the dog whistle. Everything that he has done, whether it's taking babies out of the arms of their uh, their moms. But- <laughs> he came along and said, hey, you, I'm taking that baby. Are you a mom? Yeah, even better. Whether it's issues that relate to health care in our country, access uh, to... Uh, services and the rest is is it's his whole thing is make america white again that's his thing and (laughs) and he can say a nice thing today in a tweet but the fact is his actions speak louder than his words and every day in the congress we have to fight those initiatives i'm very proud of our house democrats on different committees who fight those initiatives make america white again that's right he's just racist this just right there just throw it all out but let, but we can make it worse. We can make it worse. How about uh, Congresswoman Wilson? Do we remember her, Congresswoman Wilson? She wears the wacky cowboy hats in uh, a variety of oh, colors. Oh, that, that idiot. Oh, John. She really can... T- she takes what Nancy Pelosi says and what Maxine Waters says and puts it into a, a bundle of joy. Well, look, in fact, look. the president called you wacky. Uh, in a tweet more than a year ago, which is similar language to what he has used with Omarosa Manigault Newman over the last couple of days. He called her wacky as well. Do you see a racial chinge to those comments like you chinge. clearly see chinge. something racial? Wait, wait, wait. Dogs? What did he say? It's chinge? He said race, racial chinge. chinge. <laughs> what is a chinge? He meant to say tinge. <laughs> well, let's make sure now. Hold on. Chinge. Is this a word? Oh, Urban Dictionary. No. It shows up as top hit. No. Chinge. A beard which connects from the chin to the minge. <laughs> oh, that's not what you Racial chinge. Chinge. A race is, is a racist beard. Racial chinge. What a moron. Racial chinge. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a chinge of pepper. To those comments, like you clearly see something racial with a dog statement. <laughs> I, 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 I said it a year ago, almost, uh, that Mr. Trump is a white supremacist. Oh, yeah. He has surrounded himself with white supremacists, and everything that comes out of that White House is racist. Racist! So what he says is racist. The people around him, what they think, what they say, how they act, it's all racist. And we've got to stop well, this. And look, look, I don't, I don't expect said, anything more from him. I do want to point out, she does use the Maxine Waters racist terminology. But to call Amarosa a dog, that's his trusted advisor. Uh, how, how dare he? You Ooh. called uh, the president of the United States a white supremacist, uh, surrounding himself with white supremacists and everything that comes out of this White House is racist. Do you believe that everyone who works in the White House is a racist? Not everyone who works in the White House, but in order to uh, work there, you have to have some sort of value system, and it has to align itself with racism. (laughs) Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to exist in the White House. (laughs) It is that thick. It is that clear. Wow! (laughs) Just so you know, you're you're up to date on the White House. It's racist. And this woman keeps getting reelected. I guess. The best, though, from the M5M this past week came there's from... more? There's, yes, there's one more. <laughs> came from... Well, no, actually, there's a couple more. This came from the Cuomo kid. And he has something called uh, closing arguments. By the way, there's something I noticed that's very creepy about this guy. Not so much about his show. And I know you don't watch it, and I... I tend not to watch the whole thing. It's very difficult. Um, but t- the style these days that I've seen, Fox is doing it. I've seen MSNBC do it. Uh, you know, they now have the, the try box. So you got, they're doing the presenter, the host, in this case, the Cuomo kid in the middle. Yep. And then they do the count, the latest. count, count uh, point, counterpoint to the left and the right in a box. Right. And it's the latest and the and the person who is the right wing, crazy alt writer, na- white nationalist Nazi is on the right box. Makes sense. Yeah. And yep. the normal person is on the left box. 
Yeah. With Cuomo show. So and it's, it's basically a head and shoulder shot of everybody. Now, right. if you had these three boxes in a row and you have these three head and shoulders, it's comfortable to watch. But what they do with the Cuomo kid is they zoom his box in so it's bigger than the other two heads. And it looks like he's like he's a, you know, one of those heads on the front of a ship just is leering, the, is, leering is out there, of the television. Wait, let me get it. I'm going to ask you some questions. OK. Is his box itself is bigger? Yes. Yeah. It extends higher and broader. Okay. It okay, overlaps the one. other boxes. Right, which is not the way it's supposed to be done. It's very uncomfortable to watch. No, it's no good. It's, uh, he probably insisted on that, or his producer. Somebody did. Somebody I, did. Yeah, it's somebody stupid did. because if you look and at now, it. Now like, wait, I got question two. Yeah, is him within the box? If it was scaled to size, is he? Is the shot tighter on him? Yeah. Oh people? yes. Yeah, it's tighter. It should be so head wait, and so shoulders. We have a tighter shot, mm-hmm. which is, should be good enough. Yeah. As a, so we have a tighter shot in a bigger box. He looks like a giant Max Headroom popping out in between these uh-huh. other two people. That is really uh, amateurish. It, everything about it is wrong for all you know television production reasons. It's very creepy. Yeah. But then when you hear, when they zoom in and it's just him alone, he does his closing arguments. Here he's going to explain that when Antifa, Antifa gets violent or counter protesters or pro comms or whatever you would like to call them uh when they use violence it is different than when a alt right white nationalist nazi kkk hitler loving nazi does it there's different kinds of violence in the cuomo kid explains welcome back to prime time here's a closing argument two wrongs and what is right so let's all agree on some common understandings a protester uses their voice song slang slurs there's a huge range but it is talk when you use your hands in a violent way you are a rioter and unless you're justified in defending yourself and you hit someone you're a thug you're a criminal you attack cops you slap the media you are in the wrong period but i argue to you tonight all punches are not equal morally in the eyes of the law yes but in the eyes of good and evil here's the argument if you're a punk who comes to start trouble in a mask and hurt people you're not about any virtuous cause you're just somebody who's going to be held to the standard of doing something wrong but when someone comes to call out bigots and it gets hot even physical are they equally wrong as the bigot they are fighting i argue no fighting against hate matters now how you fight matters too there's no question about that but drawing a moral equivalency between those espousing hate and those fighting it because they both resort to violence emboldens hate legitimizes hateful belief and elevates what should be stamped out two wrongs and what is right the bigots are wrong to hit Antifa or whomever, anarchist or malcontent or misguided, they are also wrong to hit. But fighting hate is right. (laughs) And in a clash between hate and those who oppose it, those who oppose it are on the side of right. Think about it. Civil rights activists, were they the same morally as the bigots, as the racists with whom they exchanged blows? Are people who go to war against an evil regime on the same moral ground as those they seek to stop from oppressing the weak? It's not about it being right in the eyes of the law, but you also have to know what's right and wrong in a moral, in a good and evil sense. That's why people who show up to fight against bigots are not to be judged the same as the bigots, even if they do resort to the same kinds of petty violence. (laughs) My God, man. Wow. What a, <laughs> wow. And by the way, this is another example of like when Rob Reiner's going on about patriotism and the yeah, flag. Yeah. This guy's going on about moral re- religiosity practical, <laughs> in a practical sense. You know, who's right and wrong, good versus evil. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of these guys, all these atheists become so, you know, crazy about, you know, they flip the script on everybody. Uh, beyond me it's for their paycheck i'm i can presume they're they're in the milieu they're swept up in it as they believe it they believe all these things it's what they talk about the water cooler in the in the cafeteria is they believe it they believe this it's their truth and they really 
I can't fault them for really going all in on the nut job stuff because they've been trained to believe this. It's it's uh, mind control. And by the way, talking about kind of flipping the script, not knowing what you're doing, I, I do want to go do a call back to the Col- uh, Bernie on the Colbert show mm-hmm. with a very short clip. This is like – I thought that this had changed, but apparently Bernie never got the memo on the Koch brothers. Okay. Is a Republican Party, which in the last 30 years has moved uh, very, very far to the right. Uh, you have the Koch brothers, <laughs> uh, one of the wealthiest families in this country, whose ideology is now the ideology of the Republican Party and of Trump. No, it's not. He, doesn't he understand this? Apparently he doesn't. He's just just lathering. His he's not flipping the-, the script. He's using the last election script. That's what's going on. Yes, you're right. <laughs> you show my support by donating to No Agenda. What an Imagine idiot. all the people who could do that. <laughs> what an idiot. Oh, yeah, that'd be fab. Sorry. Yeah, on No Agenda in the morning. And, of course, we do have a few people to thank for show 1060, starting with Haley Hunsinger in t- uh, Tigard, Oregon, 188.18. And it's a birthday for... Uh, Sir American Carnage. Uh, Andrew Blowers, or Blowers is the way it would be pronounced, not Blowers, Blowers, uh, in Windsor Mill, Maryland, 12435. Hmm. That's an anniversary. Congratulations, Keith. Oh. <clears throat> nice. Kyle Mann. Wait, it says, Adam, I think of you as the dad I never had. Oh, son. Come here, son. I'll teach you how to drink and drive a truck. Kyle Mann in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 120. John Prebaz in Washington, D.C., 100. Uh, best podcast in the universe. Got another happy birthday. You're on the list. For his beautiful uh, Robert- fiance, Taylor. Yes. Taylor. Oh, and, Taylor. and wedding karma for their upcoming nuptials on September 29th. Yes. Oh, we'll put that at the end. Robert Young in Annandale, Virginia, 8888. These are the last of these, 8888. He wants a photograph. Sir John uh, in Heber Springs, Arkansas, 8888. Michael. Asked Falk, uh, never had a fight. He yeah, says. 88, 88, and they never had a fight. Ah, ah. Gregor Z- Zayachuk, Zayachuk, Z- Ah, A-Y-Y. Mount Kisco. I, I've been to Mount Kisco. Mount Kisco, yes. Let's go to the Zales in Mount Kisco. Sir Cal, 88, 88. Uh, Ty Robinson. Is that Sir Cal from the Lavender Blossoms? Uh, I think Sir Cal and the team. I think so. Could be. Yeah. I, I thought we had a. We, I know we got a. a could be a, a different lavender one. blossoms uh, donation in here somewhere. That might be it. Okay. Ty Robinson and uh, lavenderblossoms.com. Is that the name? 8888 Queen Creek, Arizona. Um, D douching needed for Timothy Lang and Mount <laughs> You've been D douched. He also wants to call out Patrick as a douchebag. Douchebag. His donation was 8008, the, the boob. 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 Sir Paul from Twickenham, Middlesex, UK, Great Britain. He says, been listening uh, for five years now. The show has got me through some good times and bad times. Donating really makes you feel part of the community, and I recommend everyone to donate when they can. Love the show. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Paul from Twickenham. Uh, sir, or sir, Baron Mark Tanner in Whittier, California, six 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 comes in twice a month. Uh, Christopher Dector, fifty six seventy eight. Jeffrey Tubig, Tuhig. Oh, Tuhig. Now, now they just did a uh, Jeffrey and uh, Rebecca did a meet up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I'm going to read this. Jobs karma for my lady Rebecca as she drives home from her job up north. Love you mucho. Also for my job interview today, yes, in the morning to Anthony and Chris from the Albuquerque meetup this week, I'll be attending New York Comic Con for my first time this year. Hope to work in that industry, Jeffrey. Uh, you know, I stayed with Jeffrey when I did the, ooh, was that the first Hot Pockets tour? I think the Hot Pockets tour went through New you Mexico. two of them. Yeah, yeah, I don't remember. But uh, I've seen him, a couple, I, I've done two meetups with him. Nice guy. Then Rebecca's at sweetheart. Thank you very much. Sir Eric VM, Baronet of the Valley, $50.38. He says, your past few shows have been superb. Lindsay in Alexandria, Virginia. Ah, uh, 50.01. And the following people are $50 donate, donators. 
get to the end pretty quickly today. It's Brandon Savoie in Port Orchard, Washington. John Camp in Antlers, Oklahoma. Micah Miller in Bethel, Pennsylvania. But uh, Dame Patricia Worthington in Miami, Florida. Uh, Robert Weber, send us a note, Patricia. Robert Weber, San Jose, California. <laughs> send John a picture, I think is what he's saying. I don't know. Oh, send a picture to Adam. Oh, you can send a picture to me, too, but send me a copy. <laughs> uh, Philip T. Paxton, uh, 50. I've not listened to some time doing t- for a host of reasons, but reading your newsletter in, on identity politics compelled me not to only start listening again, but to donate. The essays do work. Well, thank you. <laughs> we actually usually get, when I write one of them, they get the donations go down. <laughs> yeah. it's always, they always do. It's, yeah, it does seem to work that way. Uh, Matt, so I don't do them a lot. Matt Bo, Bolik, Bolik, I think. Bolik, bulky, bul- bulky, 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 bulky. Uh, Brian Math at fifty dollars. Brian Matthews in Balbergen, Ireland, Ireland, hmm. Ireland. Eh? Uh, John Haller in Missoula, Montana. Trevor Hoagland in Portland, Oregon. Keith Yarborough in Austin, Texas, down the street from you. Hmm. Mm, Hardy Matthew Matthew Hardy in Gold Coast. Queensland, Australia, Chris Lewinsky, Sir Chris sure. Lewinsky in Sherwood Park, Alberta, Kyle Meyer in Atlanta, Georgia, Frank Molinari in Bolverd, Texas, Sir Jerry Wingenroth in Saugus, California, and last but not least, Jason Deluzio in Chatsford, Pennsylvania. I want to thank all these folks for supporting the show and producing show 1060. Indeed. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who came in under $50 typically for reasons of anonymity, but a lot of you are on the subscription programs. We really appreciate that. The 1111s, the 33s, uh, there's a number of them. You can all check them out at Dvorak.org slash N-A. And we have another show on Sunday. Remember us there as well and as requested. Jobs, 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 and jobs. Let's vote for jobs. You've got karma. Here's our list for today. It is August 16th, 2018. John Prebaz says happy birthday to his beautiful fiance Taylor. She turns thir- she turned 30 on the 14th of August. Sir Paul from Twickenham celebrates today. Uh, Haley Hunsiger and Baronet to Susan Johnson both say happy birthday to Sir American Carnage, who celebrates on the 18th. And Scott and Mary Beth McKay say happy birthday to their son Mitch. His birthday will be on August 26th. Happy birthday from everybody here at the best podcast in the universe. It's your birthday. And, oh, we do have one nighting, so this is good news. Let's do, uh, I got my blade always ready. How is your blade? Caller 100. It is right here. Yeah, blade right there. Right there. Oh, nice. Anonymous, hop up on the podium here, my friend, right next to the round table of the No Agenda Knights and Dames. You have supported the program uh, in the amount of $1,000 or more, and we are therefore very, very proud to bring you into the table and pronounce the KC. Anonymous as Surrealist. And for you, we have Hookers and Blow, Rent Boys and Chardonnay. We got Cookies and Vodka, Warm Beer and Cold Woman, Taquito and Taquilla. We got Parliaments and Pale Ale, Pog and Poi, Rabbit Milk, Rabbit Meat and Goat Milk. We got Bourbon and Bong Rips, Pepperoni Rolls and Power Cords. We got Ginger Ale and Gerbils, Bong Hits and Bourbon, Geishas and Sake. And yes, even some Mutton and Mead. It is a fan favorite at the table. Uh, go to noagendanation.com slash rings. Uh, give Eric the shill your ring size. He'll tell you how to do it. And we'll get that out to you as soon as possible. And tweet it to us. We'd love to hear from you. I did want to mention something. Um, okay. As this purge was taking place, you know, I'm a big fan of the de- you know decentralized networks, uh, the way the internet works best, I think. Uh, Mastodon, of course, we have noagendasocial.com. Which has been really running quite nicely for uh, for a while now. Maybe it's been up for what nine, eight, nine months now. Yeah. No, you, you're never there. <laughs> you I, I, I'm there all the time, looking. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, sure, you're looking. Um, then I was just thinking about, you know, wouldn't it be great if kids could just, you know, easily set up their own Mastodon server and just create a little? Because you know, when you set one up and it's completely empty. The public timeline, all that stuff, there's nothing. It only happens when either you start following people or people start following you. Um, 
if there's another user on your system, then whoever that person follows or who follows them will show up in the in the what they call the federated timeline. So you can really create your own little uh, ecosystem, which has content that you know if you bring people in in the beginning, it's like seeding it and it grows. It's it's very that's what happened with No Agenda Social. You, know, you put a couple of people in. Uh, you know, these people created their own little environment. They're following people. They're talking back and forth across different instances. Uh, of course, that's how we got on the big block list. <laughs> no agenda social is a free speech zone. You should block it. And I'm not kidding. That's literally what they say because we're a free speech zone. But I was thinking it Who's would be. they? We're on the block list? Oh, we've been on the block list from day one almost. On that that woman's block list? Well, uh, mastodon.social. Uh, it was kind of the first, you know, the Genesis instance. They they have a block list because a bunch of you know people are whiny over there, but that's the way it's supposed to work. I like. I, I'm not a fan. You were blocked of, by the master uh, by the master Mastodon account. It, by the anyone on that server cannot communicate with us at all. And this is the master server. Well, it's not really. There's no master server, but that's kind of the first one where everyone got their first account to learn how to what the system is. I'm but, appalled. But it doesn't matter because the, you know people who want to federate with us federate with us, and there's still tons of stuff, and there's lots of people who will even get an account on our instance just to fight with us. You know, it's okay. Uh, but there's total control. Uh, users are much more in control than anything else, and you know, there's no entity they can kick you off the whole system because. It's federated, um, and really, that's kind of a. I, I have to say, Dave Weiner had the right idea. It's, but this is a. This is like RSS, only it's a different system, which is why he'll never change. It will never bring his smarts to the table again. But the activity uh, pub system at protocol is uh, is very good. Anyway, long story short, I found this kid just by himself. I think his name is Hugo. And he has this uh, site called Masto.host. And for five bucks a month for up to 200 users, but unlimited bandwidth, et cetera. And I think his top is like 25 bucks for unlimited users. You could, you know, you literally, you literally uh, register uh, email address, password, PayPal, boom, there's your Mastodon instance. It's like WordPress for, for social networks. It's really cool. Really? Yeah. And yeah, huh. WordPress is an arguable huge success for for its independence. Yes, WordPress, and that's where uh, Guccifer went. And and I and I would say that this is this is something VCs should should jump all over. Now, how you're going to get your money out? I don't know. But if that's, people are willing not to pay over anything, they can can't get their money out. I don't think so either. But for no, five bucks a month, hopeless. and this kid's got a little uh, got a little server farm actually on OVH, which is the network we use as well. Yeah, OVH is, still, uh, is it's the way to go. Yeah, operation. yeah, they got they got good deals. Um, but it's really interesting, yeah, especially because I had already set one up, and then I started to set one up. My I, it's called Sot the Psyop Shop dot com. Psyop Shop dot com. Yeah, you yeah. Hmm. <laughs> so I'm gonna put only spooks are gonna be allowed in. I have a, a couple of hit uh, me up if you're a half- spook. Sorry. Yeah, if you're a spook, go over there. I have a couple second half of show clips. Oh, well, uh, then let me get a little uh, second half. Uh, this is uh, this is a surprise. I'm sorry. Uh, mm, don't worry about it. We don't even need this steam. <laughs> okay. I can't find it. So good. So here we go. Wait, with, oh, wait I, I'll do I, it I, anyway. I here show. it is. I got it. I got it. Thanks. <laughs> Attesting all human resources. No entering second half of show. Second half of show, John C. Devore is on deck. Bring the jingle because I have two clips. I found an old Obama clip that was kind of interesting, and I and I did, did two ISOs on it. But I thought this was good. This is Obama. This is a very flippant comment he made while he's president. Okay, here we go. Uh, it, it, it was it was a wonderful trip uh, over here. We took the helicopter. We had landed in Roswell. Uh, I announced to people when I. Uh, Landed that uh, I had come in peace. <laughs> but let me tell you, uh, there are more nine and ten year old boys around the country when I meet them. They ask me, Have you been to Roswell? And is it true what they say? And I tell them, If I told you, I'd have to kill you. So <laughs> their eyes get all big. You know, so we're, we're going to keep our secrets here. 
He says well, that to, know, this is that same. He says that to, to little uh, little boys. So, uh, little, yeah, little kids. I'm going to kill you. It's very pleasant. Well, so I have the two ISOs. I have ISO one. If I told you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> that works Which better think, out of context. I like. I it. think it's a good one. Yeah. And, I, and then there's ISO two. Yeah. You know, so we're we're going to keep our secrets here. No. So that's not I, as good. Now I'm a, I'm now I'm on the fence because I thought I definitely had the end of show ISO. Well, play yours again. Okay. Uh, let me grab it here. Here's mine. Girl, did you read my book? If I told you, I'd have to kill you. Ah, perfect. A double. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, let me practice. Ooh, oh, hold on a second. I missed it. Okay, practice. Girl, did you mm. read my book? If I told you, I'd have to kill you. Perfect. You're right. Okay, we got a double double ender. Good word. Nice. Good work. Good work. Good work. Uh oh. So Detective Dookie. Uh -oh. Detective Dookie. Okay. Poop police. SPU Special Poopers Unit. We have another poop report. Hey, I'm still in the second half of show stuff. Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. Jeez, you didn't even end the second half of show. You just, you just write me off. I forgot. Well, it wasn't really second hand. It went in the second half. It went into an ISO about, uh, okay, okay, sorry. Now, I know you're not talking about it, and I figured, oh, I've, I found this killer clip, which uh, is um, – a topic that we weren't going to talk about because people keep asking me at the table. You're going to talk about the Genoa Bridge collapse? Huh. Why? What's, what's it got to do with news deconstruction? Yeah. What? So do you have a clip about it? Second half, Genoa Bridge. Listen carefully. Okay. Plunging over that bridge. Ah, I was died. You would have died. Yeah. The mother of two said the bridge started shaking violently. Then the giant A-frame tower in front of her collapsed like flour. The cone, yes, fall down like a flower. Like flour. Mm, like a flower, and was like also the twin towers. Just yeah. dust. <laughs> yes. She abandoned her car and ran for her life. <laughs> Are you a 9/11 truther now about the bridge? So the bridge turned into flour. First, when I first heard, it, I said it's like a flower. I don't well, know. That's what a directed about. energy weapon. Ah, boom! I win the bet. I knew that's what you'd say. <laughs> now entering second half of show. <laughs> yeah. I knew that's what you'd say. How much did you win? Dollar. Oh. Nice. Right. Very nice. <laughs> All right, we're out of second half. Actually, I, I was thinking you're going to say particle beam, but same thing. No, the directed energy weapon is, is good. Yeah. Well, uh, Ooh, that, well. That, there is a directed energy weapon popping up in Los Angeles. Californians. Oh, wait, not that one. I thought you were going to the poops. No, no, I'm gonna, I'll come back to poops. Uh, here it is. This is the one I was looking for. It is called through vision. This is the newest technology that's going to be used to detect weapons. L.A. Oh, County, yeah. Metro, it's the first public transportation system in the country to use this. This is going to be the extra layer of protection to make sure you're safer in public transportation. Here's how it works. Commuters walk by the small mobile machine and they're scanned for weapons. This new technology was tested and tweaked by the TSA for more than a year. Then, Metro jumped on the opportunity to bring it to Southern California. This is uh, a completely non-evasive and portable screening system uh, that passively scans weapons or individuals for weapons and have explosive you, devices. Have you seen this thing? No, I, I thought it was just a metal detector. No. So it's a flight case. It opens up and it has a, um, a flat antenna on the front and it's aimed at the escalator coming down to the subway. So everybody coming down to the sub, it's just like, uh, what was the Schwarzenegger movie where you walk, you, you're going to get on the, on the, on the shuttle and you walk past the screen and they see your bones. Yeah. Was that Terminator? I don't remember. Yeah. Either that or the Mars thing. So it's just like that. They, they, it, it's uh, it's terahertz. It's, I think it's 249 gigahertz. Something like that. They call it. No, it'd be a, more than that. Yeah, it is more than that. Hold on. Uh, the terahertz waves are the hardest waves to to find oscillators for. Uh, it's almost in fact terahertz uh, research. If you can start a terahertz company up and actually get it to do anything, you make a lot of money. Well, this is it. This is the terahertz 
uh, through what's vision. The fre- what's the frequency, Kenneth? Okay. All right, I'm going to take a look now. I'm gonna, I have their website here. It's through, T-H-R-U, throughvision.com. And, oh, hold on. Ah, I got a whole bunch of information in the show notes about uh, about terra hate, uh, uh, terahertz waves. Okay, about. Here we go. Uh, shoot. No, they don't. Of course, they're not telling us about that on their webs. I thought they did. Anyway, it's yeah. Terahertz is, but there's a lot of conflicting information about this. You know, is this the kind of stuff that can rip apart your DNA? <laughs> Some nobody people, knows. Some people say yes. Now they say it's. It goes, they say it's, if it's shown your bones. It probably can. Well, they say it only shows. It goes through clothing, uh, but doesn't go through the skin. So you, basically, it's a very low. What you're seeing in the report is a very low res, uh, naked body scanner. It's extremely low res. What they show, um, uh, but they say it's passive, meaning that it's, it's only detecting radiation you already have. And not so, active. No. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I know. I saw this story, too. I didn't know what to make of it. And I saw the thing. that You're coming down. I mean, the Chinese had these things during the SARS epidemic. Yeah. Well, look were... how tiny the, the Chinese are. <laughs> okay. So I'm just saying. <laughs> we don't need to talk about yes. it anymore. I'm just You made my point right there. May not be good for you. I... From the way things are going, I can't believe it's good for you. Mm-mm. Here is a warning from the FBI. This is the kind of stuff that we love in the false flag community. The FBI has warned international banks that their cash machines could oh, be yeah. mass hacked by cyber criminals in the next few days. In a confidential mm-hmm. alert on Friday, the FBI told banks that they could be targeted by an organized group of cyber criminals that work together to plan coordinated attacks on cash machines. The FBI said that it had unspecified reporting indicating that cyber criminals were plotting an attack soon, relating to an unknown card issuer breach. This warning, which was first reported by Krebs on security, is thought to have been issued to all banks with international operations, such as Barclays and HSBC. This type of cybercrime, which is known as ATM jackpotting, allows criminals to take millions of bills in just a matter of minutes from cash machines around the world. They hack into a bank system and access user data and can trigger changes in an account's information, such as the balance, to make cash machines dispense more money until they are completely empty. Criminals group together to access different cash machines at the same time and empty them of funds before the banks can react. This is very different to credit card skimmers, which can steal information off of one single account. Hackers in this incident could access money from hundreds of different accounts at once. Incidences of ATM jackpotting have worsened over the last year, with several incidences reported in Europe and Asia. Should this attack happen, it would likely send shockwaves through financial institutions, although small, independent banks are the most vulnerable to attack, according to our experts. While the banking industry is heavily regulated and many have sophisticated cybersecurity, it doesn't make them less of a target for criminals looking to make some money very quickly. Whether it's going to happen or not is irrelevant. It's just the scare tactic works. Well, it has happened before. They don't report on it much because it's embarrassing. This exact uh, type of breach, which seems to be different than a skimmer. Yeah, this is a uh, a jackpotting. It's where you just you somehow you code the you send some code to this thing, and it just puts out every dollar's got in there. It coughs it out. Oh. Uh, it happened a number of years ago, and it was uh, it cost the banks millions, millions. Cool. cool. So it's gonna <laughs> maybe happen again. Here's where I go: Bitcoin, baby. I don't know what Bitcoin's going to do. Detective Dookie. Detective Dookie. Poop Police. SPU. Special Poopers Unit. That's right, everybody. It's time for another episode of Poop Police. SPU. Special Poopers Unit. We go to San Francisco. Normally, when San Francisco Public Works gets a call about a dirty sidewalk or street, they send out a crew to clean it up. But in recent years, the department has seen a sharp increase in the number of service calls. 
So starting next month, a new six-man team will be hitting the streets to try to be proactive about the problem. Rachel Gordon is with San Francisco Public Works. We're going to have a dedicate, dedicated crew who will be going out in kind of known hot spots in the city where there have been complaints of feces, whether dog or human, and they'll be going out to clean it up. So that's going to be their new job. This new special team is part of a larger effort by the city to keep human and pet waste off the streets. Public Works says they've also had good luck with their pit stop program, which is made up of 22 public toilets in 12 neighborhoods across the city. We want to be able to allow people to relieve themselves. Everyone has to do it, a place with dignity that's not using our public sidewalks in San Francisco as their toilets. <laughs> but Public Works admits that keeping San Francisco clean is a big job, and they still need the public to keep reporting any problems by calling 311. It's a serious problem, uh, and it's one that we are committed to making sure we can make a difference. They need to have a, a, a snappier number. This, you know, like this one is eight, the word, by the way. 1-800-CALL-POOP. I, I don't know where you got this clip. K-R-O-N. Well, every other clip from all the other stations around here called it the poop police, which I thought is the clip you'd end up with because it makes sense with the jingle you played. Ah. And they're called the poop police or the poop patrol. Poop patrol. <laughs> They actually have that name. That's the name they gave them. And I don't know why KRON, which is a really an independent little lackey station, yeah, used yeah. to be used to be a, a contender. Well, I think the, uh, the I think poop police is better, and I think they should have badges. And while we're at it, they should be armed. It's a dangerous job out there in the streets of San Francisco. Well, they should be armed. You're right. Yeah, the pooper troopers. How about that? I like that. Pooper, but, tro <laughs> pooper troopers, I think, is better. <laughs> Excuse me, ma'am. I'm a pooper trooper. I'm here from San Francisco. SFP, SFPP, SF poop police. It's okay. Don't worry because they're pooping in Los Angeles too. Californians raging against the technology revolution. This is from RT. Revolution have found a new target: scooters. There's these companies who rent electric paper minute scooters. They're dockless, meaning the scooters are hanging out on sidewalks or near bike racks, and you can just go up to one, grab it, and scoot away to wherever you need to go. There's lots of them with cutesy names like Bird and Lime. And apparently, they're everywhere in L.A., and people hate them. As one scooter hater told the L.A. Times, they suck. People who ride them suck. This was the actual quote in the newspaper, and that man is not alone in his feelings. Because people are putting poop on them. They burn them. They toss them into toilets. They toss them off balconies. They toss them into the ocean. They I love that they're pooping on the scooters. This is a good combo deal. They bury them in the sand. They snap off their kickstands. They toss them into broken piles. They're getting really creative for how to totally mess with these scooters. Don't you think it would be an idea uh, for to train the homeless in San Francisco to poop on the scooters? Because then, you know, well, the I would like to see the homeless on the scooters just <laughs> scooting around. <laughs> I've seen, you know, now that you mention it, there are several clearly people experiencing homelessness who have the uh, the dockless bikes. And I don't I, I don't know exactly. I, I don't know if they're paying for it. You know, they have smartphones, a lot of them. Um but they have all the gear on it. You know, it's all, it's, I don't know, that maybe they just jack it open or something, but I, I I'm have no idea. But I don't see them on the scooters. I think, I think if someone asks me for money on the street, which it will happen the minute I walk outside, I'll say, yeah, if you ride on that scooter for me right now. <laughs> this is how much people in LA hate them. There's even an Instagram account dedicated to destroyed scooters called Bird Graveyard after the scooter company, Bird. Bird Graveyard has more than 24,000 followers and counting. And one moderator told the LA Times that they get over 100 videos and photos of scooters being defaced every day. Okay, so that's a good start. And th although this, this report is very tedious to listen to, she makes a point that all of a sudden I realize what my hatred of these scooters really is. And they only publish the most outlandish ones. It's gotten so bad that Beverly Hills has banned them for six months. L.A. City Councilman Paul Koritz is calling for the city to take all available measures to outlaw the scooters from the city entirely. And we're talking about L.A. People are supposed to like outdoor activities there. They're also big on climate change as an issue. And here they are pushing back against a mode of transportation that's a little bit lighter on the environment than cars. 
But instead of embracing them, they're pooping on them and Instagramming it. They hate these scooters so much. It might have more to do with the fact that there's a certain kind of people that ride them. As the LA Times writes, there's a growing resentment toward all the tech companies moving in along Southern California's coast, which they're now calling Silicon Beach. And even here in New York, I can say that it's usually douchebags riding on scooters, <laughs> and it annoys me too, even though I love alternative modes of transportation. Just goes to show you that no matter how good a new technology appears to be, it's only as good as the humans who use it. And so this made me think. <clears throat> I was like, you know, that's really true. There's something, because you can spot them a mile away. You know what a tech worker looks like in Austin. You just know. I mean, this is, we still got cowboy boots and hats, and I'm, that's the women. So you know that this person coming down, you know, with the satchel, obviously there's often the Google t-shirt or the Facebook logo. You, you see it's one of them. And then when they're zipping along on these scooters, and this is, it's my problem, obviously. It's, a, it's some trauma I have somewhere. You just think to yourself, what the, the fucking douchebag? You douchebag tech worker floating over the sidewalk like that? Stop it. So there's something about that. And I have to talk to my therapist to figure it out. But there's something that it, it triggers me. It does. And it's triggering other people. Here's the second thing that I find interesting. This uh, using feces as a way to vent, literally, yeah. your anger. Yeah, like chimpanzees in the zoo do the same thing, by Thank the way. Thank you. Because we're seeing a lot of this. I, it may be because there's more closed circuit cameras and there's just more you know, the internet and there's more ways to share it. I'm sure that's a, a big part of this that I'm seeing more of it. But, you know, you can't use the restroom. Woman poops on the floor, throws the poop at the guy. You know, people are pissed off at scooters, poop on them. What, and, and, you know, uh, people pooping uh, while jogging in front of their houses. I hate the students. I'm going to poop on the track. What is wrong with this? That, I think that's an illness. It's a mental illness. Maybe the insult comic dog who poops on everything should be uh, replaced. <laughs> well, of this. he's ground zero of the poop movement. But you know what I'm saying? Is this something new? <laughs> Everything's something new. But this is just this some, it's pooping something bad out of is disgust. No, but, yeah, this I'm is, telling you, this is the beginning of the end. I'm not talking about the end of the culture. <laughs> no, the, the end of the going world. Down, the republic's down the drain. All no, this bull the crap. world. The world. It's the end of the economy. The pooping? No, the whole thing. The, the Silicon Beach and Silicon this and Silicon that. Right. It can't, it's really unsustainable. It's, it's unsustainable. completely out of control. <laughs> now, on the other hand, the entire... Um, our economy is is data now. Wouldn't you say we're you know data is the new bacon? We're kind of everything's about data, so it's going to be companies that deal with data. Um, I think maybe it's just limited how much they can rip out of people through you know taking away privacy and that that will. I think there's a limit to that. You're not really being bringing people joy. You know what I mean? You're just not bringing them joy. But I, I do understand what you're saying, that when you have this in, this overindulgence and, you know, there's so many of these scooters and bikes and people can poop on them and throw them away hundreds a day, you know, you've got a, a culture that's in trouble too, it seems. But yeah, economy. I'm with you on that. Let's just keep it. And, it, you know, it reminds me, I get the feeling, I, the feeling I'm having is the feeling from 1999. Uh and it was it's the amount of bars and restaurants and things that cropped up just before the dot com crash in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And we were going to all these different places and it was just like a ton of them. There's just opening up everywhere. And Seattle is like completely out of control with the bar scene. There's all these new they're all uh, hipster bars. There's tons of them. Uh, and there's just people that add them all the time and they're all the tech workers and they're all mixing and meeting and greeting and they're drinking too much and the whole thing. It's But it's very similar to the 99 feeling, mm -hmm. not the 2008 feeling, the 99 feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, just too much going on. It's too crowded. The freeways are too jammed up and too many bars. And that's the way I see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So I'm watching CBS and Evening News. Mm -hmm. Now, they've changed their structure a little bit. This is my last couple of clips, and they're very short. They're changing, they've changed their structure a little bit um, where they have a bunch of teases at the beginning of the show. Mm -hmm. 
And then it turns out two or three of the teases, in fact, two in this case, they, everything they teased was in the show. They expanded on, you know, Brennan lost his uh, security clearance. Good. Can I just uh, say something about that? Sure. Uh, oh. the, the security clearance being lost, it, it, people need to understand why that is such an insult. Um, what I hear the uh, people like the Cuomo kids saying is, that's an assault on his First Amendment right. And the way, which is really great. And the way they explain this is uh, because he said something the president didn't like, he punished him by taking his uh, clearance away. That is punishing free speech. And I'm not kidding. This, this is how it's being explained across the board on the M5M. Uh, and therefore, that's it's borderline unconstitutional. It's uh, it's you don't do that. It's crazy. It's different. The reason why it's so embarrassing is there are 5.9 million people in America with clearance. 1.5 million of them have top secret clearance. He's a he's a loser. Bah! He's a you loser. can't even keep the clearance. Bah! That's why it's so embarrassing. Is because very anybody can get this. A million and a half people have top secret clearance. Well, he won't be able to talk to any of them now. So his usefulness at MSNBC has been diminished. And it's true because uh, I think I've told the story before. Um, at uh, when my when my grandparents no is this are they still alive? Anyway, it was a, a niece once removed somehow, and she's part of the Uncle Don side of the family. And she's about 15, 16. We're sitting there and the big family gathering. We're chatting and we're talking away. And I asked her, oh, really? Tell me about that. She says, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you. You don't have clearance. 16-year-old snot nose. So, oh, oh yeah. okay. Yeah, no. And they're trained. So everyone has this shit. Everyone has clearance except us. Yeah, well, we, yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. Back to your unreported uh, teaser. So they had the, they outplay all these teasers, but there were two teasers they didn't carry. I mean, they had the teaser which I have clips of, mm -hmm. but they didn't do the story. <laughs> really? Yeah. That kind of, them. well, we do that all the time, but it's just because we forget. I yeah, doubt we're they... doing it because we're just yeah, no, we forget. a show. No, we just forget. We literally so let's, forget. So let's listen to what they might be if there's maybe some reason they're not doing these stories. They are false. A new report found that popular breakfast foods and cereals contain a chemical that can be linked to cancer. Researchers found trace amounts of a chemical used to kill weeds in oats. <laughs> uh, I know what this is, and now I understand where you're going. Okay, second teaser. Wait, before you do that, they did have the picture of the Monsanto Roundup. Oh, model. they did have the picture. So they didn't mention Monsanto by name so because we know that Cheryl, Cheryl Atkinson got fired. After yeah, she, that's weird. Uh, we're all concluding that now. Mm -hmm. And so here's the other one. About 80 cars were torched overnight in Sweden by masked vandals. Police saying these are arson attacks that were coordinated online by youth gangs. Who are now in Turkey. <laughs> you mean they missed saying migrants? Well, they didn't say anything like that, but they just showed a bunch of vet. They had some video. Yeah. Uh, these kids, they're they probably migrants, and they no, they are the, the 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 kid who was um uh, was picked up and he flew back to Turtle through Turkey to get back to wherever he came from. They picked and him up there. burned the place down, and they wouldn't. They never did the story. It, it was a very interesting story for no other reason than it was all coordinated online somehow. <sighs> but no, we didn't get the story. Just a little teaser, isn't and that, that was that. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I found it very interesting. Hmm. All right. Uh, I, can, I have a can. I, Kanye West was on Jimmy Kimmel. Yeah, I saw that. I mean, was there anything you thought was re? I mean, it, it, people, some people are like, oh, yeah, he couldn't think about the president saying this or that. But I thought it was a pretty decent interview. It was pretty funny. It was okay. It wasn't anything highly controversial in my mind. No, there was nothing controversial. But he did bitch and moan about the fact that people were calling him out and making his life miserable. Okay, let's listen to that. Everyone around me tried to pick my oh, yeah. candidate for me mm -hmm. and then told me every time I said I like Trump that I couldn't say it out loud or my career would be over. I get kicked out of the black community because blacks are we're supposed to have a monolithic thought. We can only like we can only be Democrats. and all. So um, it 
Even when I said it right before I went to the hospital and I expressed myself, and when I came out, I had lost my confidence. So I didn't have the, the confidence to take on the world and the possible backlash. And it took me a year and a half to have the confidence to stand up and put on the hat, no matter what the consequences were. And what it represented to me is not about policies, and because I'm, I'm not a politician like that, but it represent it represented overcoming fear and doing what you felt, no matter what anyone said, and saying, you can't bully me. Liberals can't bully me. News can't bully me. The hip hop community, they can't bully me. Because at that point, if I'm afraid to be me, I'm no longer yay. That's what makes yay. <laughs> and I actually quite, yay. I quite enjoy when people uh, actually are mad at me about certain things. You must like, enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, Kanye is an enlightened guy. That was my takeaway from the whole interview. Yeah, I think so, too. And the thing is that he's more influential than most people oh, in the white community. Yeah. If there's yay. Such a thing. yay is influential. People. Yay. Yeah, absolutely. He's very influential. And he, he may be part of the reason that the number of blacks that are turning Republican or that put up with Trump has increased from 14 percent to 31 percent of their population. OK, and Kanye. No more small aircraft, no hot tubs, <laughs> definitely stay away from garage doors. And that is our show for today, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank in advance Tom Starkweather, uh, Hugh Allison, Sir Chris Wilson, and a cast of thousands for the end of show mixes. And thank you for showing up, Troll Room, NoAgendaStream.com. Those of you still listening, Nick the Rat will be up next at NoAgendaStream.com. Give that a listen to you. It's always on 24-7. Uh, and uh, thank you, Mr. Dvorak. Coming to you from downtown Austin, Texas, capital of the Drone Star State here uh, in FEMA Region 6 on the governmental maps in the 5 by 9 Cludio in the Common Law Condo. In the morning, everybody. I'm Adam Curry. And from Northern Silicon Valley, where uh, there's a Costco awaiting my presence. I'll be snapping my fingers. I'm John C. Dvorak. That's right. <laughs> Snap them and play the bongos. Remember us at Dvorak.org slash NA for Sunday's show. Until then, adios, mofos. I don't care what you say about old President Trump He may act stupid, but I says he ain't no chump He got one thing going in his defense Y'all ain't gonna do nothing, cause no one here wants Pence Thank you very much It is when you play in the big room, the inside room. We will reach greatness. Everybody walking with their phones. Not San Francisco, Poop City. Everybody walking with their phones. We have not reached greatness. Donald Trump is a lounge act. He continues to do a lounge act. People just lounging around intoxicated. We have not reached greatness. It is gone. Ah! Oh my God! Woo! Listen to that goat! Ah! Oh my God! Oh, she's beautiful. She is beautiful. Yeah. All right. You oh, start. Oh no! It's got karma oh too. Oh my God! It's an ITM 33. Oh my Did god! Oh, oh, oh my we're gonna watch this. This is special. This Just is special. Oh, no, that coat no, gives no, me no, the chills. No, 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 no. And it has no, 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 absolutely no, 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 no. nothing almost to do with how cold it is here. Friend. But that doesn't stop a producer. Oh, especially when it comes to making jingles. 
as we try and cool off by staying hydrated, scientists also say the heat waves in the northern hemisphere are undoubtedly linked to global warming. <laughs> As we try and cool off by staying hydrated, scientists also say the heat waves in the northern hemisphere are undoubtedly linked to global warming. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Can you stall a little bit more? The best podcast in the universe. Dvorak.org slash N-A. Girl, did you read my book? If I told you, I'd have to kill you.